In the course of Victoria's long reign, 16 million Britons would leave the mother country for a new life overseas. Each of them, whether they were searching for fame or fortune, love or adventure, would help to make the empire of Queen Victoria the widest and most powerful the world has ever seen. Most of those leaving the mother country in the 1850s were heading for the Queen's self-governing dominions of Canada, Australia and New Zealand, or the former colonies of the United States. Others were bound for the country that Victoria would one day describe as the most precious jewel in her crown, India. India was the greatest overseas territory that any empire has ever possessed. But it had been conquered not by the British Army, but by a private trading company. The East India Company had begun with a single warehouse on the west coast of India. When its trade was threatened by European rivals or Indian rulers, the company went to war. It employed its own private army of native troops, commanded by British and European officers. They won battle after battle. With each victory, thousands of new Indian recruits came over from the ranks of their defeated opponents. They swore an oath to their new employer. To serve the honorable company faithfully and truly against all their enemies, while I continue to receive their pay and eat their salt. That oath of loyalty was the most important single strand binding the British to India, and the most vulnerable. By the time of Victoria, the East India Company, with its vast native army, controlled a swath of territory across India, ten times the size of the British Isles, and with five times the population. The merchant adventurers had become conquerors, and to the victors went the spoils. The hookah-smoking agents, or nabobs of the East India Company, became a byword for splendid living and riches beyond the dreams of their countrymen in England. The Indian mistress, or Bibi as she was known, was an important, almost official feature of company life. They are so amusingly playful, so anxious to please a person, one shrinks from the idea of encountering the whims or yielding to the furies of an Englishwoman. One Englishwoman in particular was not amused. The high-spirited young woman who had become Queen of England at 18 had matured into a proud and sometimes priggish wife and mother. She and Prince Albert believed in what would become known as Victorian values. In particular, the sanctity of home and family and the supremacy of the Protestant religion. They were values shared by most of Victoria's British subjects, rich or poor. Despite the squalor and poverty of their own cities, the Victorians began to see themselves as God's chosen people, with a mission to spread the gospel to other lands. All of these things come together around this period, around 1815 onwards, uh, to develop a very new attitude uh, within, within Britain, a feeling that they are the, f the face of the future, really, and a desire to now to impose this on others. They feel they have a duty to do this, to civilize people, and this is known as the civilizing mission. And from this date onwards, really, there is, there is a great change in the attitude of the British to the Indian people. This feeling coincided with new inventions and initiatives that would bring the two worlds of England and India closer together, with horrific results for both. 
In the days before the Suez Canal, the passage from England to India was round the southern tip of Africa, a journey of some 14,000 miles that could take up to six months by sailing ship. But in 1837, the first year of Victoria's reign, the East India Company employed a retired naval officer to find a faster route. Thomas Waghorn was typical of the Victorians who would expand the British Empire. Part adventurer, part visionary, part man of business. He proposed a shortcut to India, across Egypt and down the Red Sea. Most people thought he was mad. The overland journey across Egypt was plagued by bandits, and the Red Sea was prone to sudden storms. That made it hazardous for large sailing ships. But Britain had pioneered the age of steam, and Waghorn gambled that steamships could operate on the Red Sea without fear of wind or current. As a coaling station, he used the port of Aden, the first colony acquired in Victoria's reign. Soon, regular services were plying the Red Sea between Aden and Suez. More traditional methods were employed to smooth the journey across Egypt, camels, carriages, and hefty bribes to buy off the bandits. Before long, Waghorn was running a thriving business. But his shortcut to the Orient would stir up unexpected trouble in India. The long sea voyage around the Cape had deterred many English women from joining their menfolk in the Far East. But Waghorn's shortcut made the passage to India much easier for them. In addition to the wives came thousands of young women who hoped to attract one of the company's eligible bachelors. These women were to have a dramatic effect on the way of life enjoyed by the men who ran India. With the coming of the women, there was increasing tendency to establish separate enclaves uh, for Europeans, known as contunements, which were usually on the outskirts of cities. And in these places, the Europeans uh, were able to live in, it, in their own houses. Uh, they would socialize uh, together. They wouldn't even uh, go into the town to, to do their shopping. They had their own contunement shops so that they never had to go to the native bazaar. So they were completely enclosed. And in this situation, the European women had really very little contact with the outside world. Their main contact with the Indians was with servants, and these were people whom they commanded uh, as inferiors. The amusingly playful Bibi was pushed into the shadows, slowly, but not entirely, receding. Now, instead of spending his off-duty hours in the Bibi Gar or with his men in the native quarters, the company officer was expected to retire to his bungalow and the bosom of his English family. It was not only English women who demanded change. The same steamships from England brought out missionaries who were determined to make India not only more civilized, but more Christian. The missionaries who came um, were very intolerant of Indian religions, particularly Hinduism, which they saw as a religion of superstition, of dirt and squalor, but also of idol worship. We must unite to condemn the barbarous and obscene rites of Hindu superstition. The chairman of the East India Company, himself a fervent evangelist, suggested that the company might do more in India than just make money. We might diffuse among their inhabitants, long sunk in darkness, vice, misery, the light and benign influence of the truth. There were obviously some practices carried on in India which were, you know, by any standards, reprehensible. The most disturbing of these practices was the Hindu tradition of sati, burning a widow alive on her dead husband's funeral pyre. 
ritually prepared by the priest with water, milk, and honey. When a delegation of Indian notables protested that sati was a time-honored custom of their people, General Sir Charles Napier spoke for many of his countrymen. My people, too, have a custom. When men burn women alive, we hang them. We can justify the, the British attempts to root out these practices, but I don't think we can justify the way that they, they were made into symbols of Indian degeneracy. Some Indians decided to make a stand. They would fight and die to defend their religions and culture. One of them was a young Muslim called Azamullah Khan. He would prove to be one of Britain's most deadly enemies. Azimullah's dealings with the British began as a child when he was brought by his mother to a Christian mission in the north of India. Famine was stalking the region, and mother and child were starving. The mission took them in. Azimullah was educated in the mission school where he learned to speak English and French. But he had been born a Muslim, and he resisted all attempts to convert him to Christianity. When he left the mission, he took a job as Kitmutgar, or butler in the home of an English family. He joined a great army of servants who catered to the needs of the British in India. From the relays of punkawalas who fanned the air in the stifling bungalows, to the trusted ayahs who looked after the children, and to the lofty kitmutgars who served at table. Many remained faithful to their British families through a lifetime of service. But others nursed a bitter, even murderous resentment against the sahibs and mem sahibs whose whims they had to satisfy. Such a man was Azimullah Khan. In the 1850s, Azimullah joined the followers of an Indian nobleman with his own grievances against the British. Nana Sahib was the leader of a once mighty Hindu nation, the Marathas, who had been defeated by the armies of the East India Company. Nana's father had been paid an annual pension by the company to keep his family in princely style and to maintain a small army. But when his father died, the pension died with him. His enraged heir, Nana Sahib, decided to appeal to the directors of the East India Company in London and the man he chose to represent him was Azimullah Khan. In 1853, Azimullah traveled to Britain, expecting to see the great source of power that had so impressed Muslim writers before him. It cannot be without the will of that one supreme being that this small island which seems on the globe like a mole on the body of man, should command the greater part of the world and keep the rest in awe. But Azimullah was astonished by the smoke and squalor of London. Here was none of the wealth and dignity maintained by the British in India. Instead, he saw the drunks and the whores, the beggars and the street urchins. Whole families trudging to factories and workshops. 
In the engine room of Empire, the smoke and the dirt blinded Azimula to the power and the wealth. When the East India Company rejected his appeal on behalf of Nana Sahib, Azimullah was indignant. England will yet regret the manner in which it has used my master. It seemed an empty threat, but fate would provide him with the opportunity and the weapon. As Azimullah began his return journey, the British rushed headlong into the first major war of Victoria's reign. It was provoked by fears for the security of the overland link to India pioneered by Thomas Waghorn. In the spring of 1854, Russian armies were sweeping through the Balkans and the British public clamored for action. But the government was divided. The Prime Minister wrote to the Queen, no doubt it may be very agreeable to humiliate the Emperor of Russia, but it is paying a little too dear for the pleasure to cover Europe with confusion, misery and blood. It was a view shared by Victoria's German-born husband, Prince Albert. His opposition to war became widely known, and the public turned on him in fury. Albert wrote to his brother, the public has graciously selected me as its scapegoat to answer for its not yet having come to war. The English aristocracy had never accepted the prince as one of their own. They sneered at his dress, the open-necked collar and the thigh-length boots he wore to go hunting. Not the English style at all. A letter to the Times wryly speculated on the reasons he was disliked by the upper classes. He does not gamble, does not use offensive language, and does not keep an opera dancer. The Queen suggested another. It is that unbounded dislike in England of foreigners, which breaks out continually and is very painful. In March 1854, a British fleet sailed for the Black Sea with 30,000 troops. They joined French and Turkish forces in an attack on the Russian naval base of Sebastopol in the Crimea. With the outbreak of hostilities, Albert knew where his duty lay. He embarked for France to review the troops assembled for dispatch to the Crimea and cement the shaky alliance with the French Emperor. But in the Crimea, there was little to celebrate. It had been 40 years since the British Army had fought a major war. It was ill-prepared and worse led. A British officer described the conditions. The men stand day and night in trenches full of water, holding their muskets in their cramped and half-frozen hands the rain soaking the only clothes they have in the world, which once wet will remain damp forever in this climate. The conditions of the, of the troops were was absolutely awful. That They had uh, virtually no supplies, no medical backup at all. They were starving. They were uh, running with lice. They had no tents. They lived in uh, waterlogged trenches. Uh, it, it was a small, ghastly pre-run, if you like, of, of the Great War. Britain's allies were better equipped and better nourished. A dragoon in the French army reported that the British were so desperate they would exchange their boots for something to eat. We give them what we can. It is pitiful to see such superb men asking permission to gorge themselves on the dregs in our mess tins. Dysentery and cholera swept the ranks, and disease was followed by fatal blunders on the field of battle. The Crimea witnessed the most memorable single fiasco in British military history, the charge of the Light Brigade. The Light Brigade was the finest cavalry force in Europe, but it was commanded by George Brudenell, Earl of Cardigan, who treated war as just another aristocratic hobby like fox hunting. 
He was sent a written order to recover some British cannon that had been seized by the Russians to his right. Cardigan read this and looked around, and the only guns he could see were the Russian guns directly to his front and other Russian guns on either flank. So, um, being as he was a rather impetuous officer and no, not one over endowed with brains, he uh, decided to attack. I mean, his wonderful last line as he drew his sword was, here go the last of the Brudenals, because he was in no doubt that if they went into that valley, most of them weren't coming out. And it was a total shambles. Cardigan led the Light Brigade into the wrong valley, a valley lined on three sides with Russian artillery. The carnage was described by his men in flashes of horrific detail. We advanced at a gallop amid a fearful fire from front, left and right of grape, shell and canister. Horses and men fell thick and fast. They were cut to pieces. They did actually reach the Russian guns and uh, killed the Russian gunners. And all around, you know, on the slopes, people were watching aghast with their hands over their eyes. Of the 600 men who charged into the Valley of Death, barely half rode back alive. 30,000 troops had been sent to the Crimea. Within a year, two-thirds were dead or wounded. For the first time in the history of conflict, the suffering of the men and the failings of the generals were described in graphic detail to the public at home. For the Crimea introduced the world's first war correspondent, William Russell of the London Times. The noblest army ever sent from these shores has been sacrificed to the grossest mismanagement. Incompetence, lethargy and stupidity reign, revel and riot in the camp before Sebastopol and in the hospitals of Scutari. Among the millions who read Russell's dispatches was the embittered Indian envoy Azumullah Khan. As a result, he decided to make a detour on his way back to India to see for himself what was happening to the British army and the Crimea. He toured the hospitals where a woman called Florence Nightingale was fighting to save the lives of the British wounded and bring some order to the chaos. Even in the slums of London, Azamula had never seen the British brought so low. It reinforced his belief that they were far from invincible. He would soon put his convictions to the test. On his return to India, Ezzam Mullah faced an uncomfortable meeting with Nana Saeed. He had failed to win back the prince's titles and pensions, and he had spent lavishly of his master's funds. But Ezzam Mullah had rehearsed an argument that he hoped would save him from Nana Saeed's displeasure. The British were finished, he claimed. All they needed was a final push, and then the disinherited ruler could take all that was due to him, and more. He could exact a savage revenge for all the humiliations heaped upon him by the East India Company. Over the next few months, Azimullah's agents joined other dissident Indians in a campaign of rumor and subversion. They fanned the smoldering resentment aroused by the evangelists who appeared to threaten the sacred beliefs of Hindu and Muslim alike. They whispered that the British had been defeated in the Crimea and that a Russian army was now advancing on India. None of this was true. It was the Russians who had been defeated. But the rumor was widely believed. The British agents of the East India Company were puzzled and alarmed. 
As tensions rose, they tried to keep their fears from their families. But their only security rested in the native troops of the East India Company. Sikhs, Gurkhas, Patans, Hindus, and Muslims. By the 1850s, their ranks had swollen to over 260,000. More than ten times the number of British soldiers stationed in India, and more than twice the size of the entire British army around the world. Their loyalty was vital if the British were to remain in India. And in the wake of the Crimean War, the company made a seemingly trivial decision that would prove disastrous. British instructors began to train their Indian troops to use a new rifle, the Lee Enfield, with a cartridge that was greased with animal fat. A rumor spread that the grease was made from a mixture of beef and pork, one forbidden to Hindus, the other to Muslims. It triggered a revolt known to the British as the Indian Mutiny and to the Indians as the First War of Independence. On June 4, 1857, the Indian troops attacked their British officers and set fire to their quarters. The entire European community of 1,000 men, women, and children fled to a half-built barrack block on the edge of the city, hastily fortified against attack. Two days later, Nana Sahib joined the rebels with his own army and took personal command of the siege. The makeshift fortress was raked by cannon and musket fire. As a mullah mockingly called it, Fort Despair. On June 10th, news of the revolt reached Britain, and 30,000 troops were sent to deal with the crisis. But it would take several months for the slow-moving troop ships to reach India. Meanwhile, at Kanpur and nearby Lucknow, the beleaguered British garrisons held out week after week under constant bombardment. Several hundred women were besieged within makeshift defences. Gradually whittled away, several of them having babies as went along, disease coming in, of course, lack of food. It was a most horrific experience. One of the women, 18-year-old Amelia Horn, described the horrors in detail. Every shot that struck the barracks was followed by heart-rending shrieks of women and children who were either killed outright by the projectiles or crushed to death by falling beams, masonry and splinters. Sometimes a whole family would be found lying dead side by side. The only source of water was a well swept by sniper fire. On one occasion, we were obliged to drink some water mixed with human blood from the wounds of a native nurse or ayah, who, while standing nearby, had both her legs carried away by the bursting of a shell. On June 12th, the hospital block was set alight by shell fire, burning many of the wounded to death and destroying all the remaining medical supplies. No relief whatever could now be offered to the sick and wounded. There was nothing now to soothe their dying moments. The heat affected their wounds, and the flies settled on them and drove them crazy. It was now that our skirts were in demand. We tore every vestige to supply bandages for the wounded. On the 25th of June, 1857, Nana Saib offered a deal. If the British would move out, he guaranteed safe conduct for the survivors to leave Kanpur by boat down the river Ganges. They had no choice but to accept. 
The point of departure was a Hindu temple where the faithful took their ritual baths. A fleet of boats had been assembled with native crews to punt the survivors to safety. Thatched awnings protected them from the heat of the sun. But as the Europeans climbed aboard, the boatmen leapt ashore, scattering burning embers from their cooking stoves. Hundreds of native troops emerged from hiding and fired volley after volley into the burning boats. Mounted troopers rode into the water, slashing down with their sabers. Over 500 men, women and children died in the massacre of Kanpur. Just four men escaped downriver to tell the tale. About 120 women and children who had survived the slaughter were rounded up on the riverbank. The captives were herded into a building where the Indian mistress of a British officer had once lived, known as a bibigar. But help was finally on the way. A scratch force of a thousand Scottish Highlanders, a few English Fusiliers and some loyal Sikhs had been sent from other parts of India. They marched down the Grand Trunk Road in the full heat of the Indian summer. Nana Sahib set out to confront them at the head of 5,000 rebels. The new rifles played a key role, picking the rebels off at long range. The result was a victory for the British. The survivors fled back to the city to warn their supporters. The British are coming like mad beasts, caring for neither cannon nor musketry. At the Bibigar, the number of captives had risen to 180 women and children, crowded into the three rooms and courtyard of the house. Many of the prisoners were wounded, dying of cholera and other infections, or broken by heat and despair. A few recorded their experiences on scraps of paper or scratched them on the walls with charcoal and broken bits of pottery. They could hear the rumble of guns as the relief force neared the city. But the faces that appeared at the windows were not those of British soldiers. The mutineers fired two volleys into the crowded room but sickened by the slaughter, they refused to fire again. Four butchers were recruited from the town. It was a little before sunset when they entered the Bibigar. They emerged an hour later. At the sight of them, the remaining onlookers fled into the darkness. In the morning, a party of volunteers arrived to clear the bodies. They dragged them out of the building, stripped them of their blood-soaked clothing, and threw them down a nearby well. Eyewitnesses reported that several women and children were still alive, but they were thrown in along with the mutilated corpses. I think the attacks on women can be explained in terms of a belief that the honor of a particular group was reposed in the women uh, and often uh, when, when a group uh, w was conquered in war women were attacked, raped, taken away into slavery and so on. Uh, this, was, this was part of humiliating an enemy. The streets of Kanpur were deserted as the relief force entered the city. Thousands had fled before them. Loyalists directed the advance guard to the Bibigar. The first to open the door was a young officer of the 78th Highlanders. He reported that the scene he saw 
was the most awful that the eye could behold. He was wrong. A few moments later, he found the well. The news reached Britain a few weeks later. When the details begin of the mutiny begin to appear in the British press in the summer of 1857, there is horror and outrage. Uh, stories were coming back of the murder of European women and children, often in the most hideous circumstances. And the, the, the sort of respect which the Victorians had for women and for children, this was outraged. Victoria wrote to the wife of the Governor General in Calcutta. Our thoughts are almost solely occupied with India. My heart bleeds for the horrors that have been committed by people once so gentle on my poor countrywomen and innocent little children. It haunts me day and night. The massacres at Kanpur were not only the worst atrocity the British could imagine. They were regarded by the men who had conquered India as the most shameful reproach. They had failed their women and children. The darkness of the well at the Bibigar closed over them all. Atrocities, well, that was actually war. And when you have war, there are bound to be some excesses. On both sides, yes. Well, it, was, it started off with uh, a bunch of people, soldiers, who had a simmering resentment against the British who were lording it over them. So when they got the chance to get back at them, they were, maybe were quite excessive. But uh, thereafter, the retributions were quite terrible. Thousands of British reinforcements poured into the affected area. Nana Sahib's palace was looted and leveled to the ground. But Nana Sahib and his followers had fled to the mountains. And with them, Azimullah Khan. They were hunted by the British for years, but never found. Instead, the British turned on other targets for their revenge. What had happened at Kanpur? became the justification for brutal reprisals. You have people like Dickens uh, saying, you know, we must retaliate with the fiercest measures. Well, they, need, they could save their breath. This was already happening in India. Clergymen are talking in terms of, we need more massacres, more must be killed. And it reached such a point that some observers thought that the British people were suddenly revealing a deep down savagery, which everyone thought had disappeared. Captured mutineers were taken to the Bibigar and made to lick the congealed blood from a patch of floor. Then they were strung up from the nearest tree. But the noose did not satisfy the army's thirst for revenge. Any rebel whom they captured, they would either kill on the spot or they would torture them um, or ritually pollute them by forcing say Muslims to eat pork or Hindus to eat beef after which they would hang them um, from a tree from a scaffold or blow them from guns this they did by uh, attaching their arms to the large wheels of the guns of those days and their body in front of the barrel of the gun and just blowing them to, to pieces Back in England, powerful voices were raised against the British descent into barbarity. At Windsor Castle, the Queen and Prince Albert sank into a deep gloom. The news from India seemed a mockery of Albert's hopes for the spread of civilized values through trade. At his urging, the Queen wrote to the Governor General in India. I should deeply deprecate any retribution on old men, women and children, for then how could we expect any respect or esteem for us in the future? <laughs> 
As a mood of grief and shame descended on Britain, Victoria declared October 7th a national day of humiliation. So that we and our people may humble ourselves before Almighty God in order to obtain pardon for our sins and send up prayers to the Divine Majesty for the restoration of tranquility. But one thing would not be restored. The British government decided that a country the size of India could no longer be ruled by a private trading company. Prince Albert helped draft the royal proclamation that assumed direct rule by the British Crown. He insisted the document should breathe feelings of generosity, benevolence, and religious toleration. The Queen agreed. In the final version, she assured her Indian subjects, The deep attachment which Her Majesty feels to her own religion, and the comfort and happiness which she derives from its consolations, will preclude her from any attempt to interfere with the native religions, and her servants will be directed to act scrupulously in accordance with her directions. May the proclamation be the beginning of a new era, and may it draw a veil over the sad and bloody past. As a symbol of her trust in her new subjects, from then on, on almost every occasion she appeared in public, two Indian attendants would be at her side. But not the man who had been there since the early years of her reign, the man who had taught her how to rule an empire. In December 1861, Prince Albert fell ill at Windsor Castle. The Prime Minister was alarmed. The Queen was not. The Prince has had a feverish cold these last few days, which disturbed his rest at night. But Her Majesty has seen His Royal Highness similarly affected before and hopes that in a few days it will pass off. But the Prince grew worse. The doctors suspected that he had fallen victim to a killer disease lurking in the drains of the medieval castle, typhoid. Victoria charted his decline in snatches of anguished prose. In an agony of despair about my dearest Albert, and crying much for saw no improvement and my dearest Albert was so listless and took so little notice. She recorded the final scene in Albert's bedroom on December 14th, 1861. I bent over him and said to him, It is your little wife. I took his dear left hand, which was already cold, though the breathing was quite gentle, and I knelt down by him. Two or three long but perfectly gentle breaths were drawn, the hand clasping mine, and all... All was over. That single death in Windsor Castle was to change the course of Victoria's empire. Death robbed the queen of her beloved husband, Prince Albert. Victoria ordered that his dressing room be preserved as a shrine. Then she donned the robes of mourning that she would wear for the rest of her life. But the loss of Albert would have more profound consequences. It would plunge the queen and her greatest statesmen into a titanic struggle for the heart and soul of her empire. Queen Victoria had been inspired by Prince Albert's ideas, and in particular by his vision of Camelot, the fabled realm of King Arthur. According to legend, Arthur ruled over an empire whose greatness was judged not by the extent of its conquests, but by a belief that the strong should serve the weak, that good must triumph over evil, that might should be in the service of right.
Albert hoped that these principles would be the guiding light for Victoria and for her people. But in the coming years, that dream would be shattered as the Queen, alone and more vulnerable, allowed the Empire to take a very different path, a path which would lead her to the betrayal of Albert's ideals. Victoria changed after Albert's death. In Albert's day, his feeling of civilizing the world meant bringing uh, trade and education and uh, progress and uh, better standards of living to people. Victoria became less interested in that. Victoria wanted England to be dominant, to be preeminent. She thought it was the destiny of Britain to rule as much of the world as possible. Victoria's empire had come about more by accident than by design. It was an empire based on trade, and to sustain it, the British had acquired naval bases, coaling stations, and colonies around the globe. By the middle of the 19th century, the British had become the richest and most powerful nation in the world. They had pioneered the Age of Steam. They made more than half the world's industrial goods and three quarters of the world's trade was carried in British ships. But despite this success, Victoria's cities were pits of poverty and deprivation. Nonetheless, her subjects, rich and poor, were united in the belief that God had chosen them for a special mission, to export not just the product of their industry, but their ideas of government, law, and morality. Britain is a democracy, and the British people wish to know why their government is behaving a certain way. If it is acquiring more territory, if it is fighting wars, then they'd like to know the reason. And the simple reason is uh, development of the older idea of Britain as the agent of civilization. Britain is bringing peace and order and stability to the world, uh, to distant regions. In the Victorian mind, nowhere was this civilizing mission more compelling or more dangerous than in Africa. In the mid-19th century, Africa was known as the Dark Continent, its vast interior largely unexplored by white men. It was believed by the Victorians to be a place of pagan worship, of blood sacrifice and tribal conflict. Inspired by Albert's vision of Camelot, men and women of the London Missionary Society journeyed here on a crusade to win converts to the Christian God, resolute in the belief that they were civilizing the continent. They included a man whose journeys into the heart of Africa would make him the most famous explorer of the Victorian age. His name was David Livingstone, a Scotsman. Born into a family of poor but passionate Christians, he worked in a cotton mill from the age of 10 and paid his own way through medical college. He had heard that you could be a medical missionary, and that's, that's what he said, that's for me. And his father was a bit against this. He said, oh, doctors, oh, they, they just look for their fees and so on. But he was uh, fired with enthusiasm to take the gospel further and um, working as a doctor and a missionary he wasn't just going to deal with their the spiritual side he'd deal with the bodily side as well when Livingston began his travels the main British possession in Africa was a mere toehold on the southern tip of this vast continent the port of Cape Town was a staging post on the long sea route to India British governments had no interest in the interior, which was believed to be just thousands of miles of arid scrubland. But as Livingston traveled northward to the continent's great central plateau, he discovered a different Africa. The scenery changed dramatically from desert to grassland, with tall trees and exotic wildlife. Livingston wrote copious notes, documenting all the flora and fauna in minute detail. 
but it was a less pleasant encounter with the local wildlife that would first make him famous back in England. The doctor was working on an irrigation ditch when he was alerted that some lions were approaching the camp. He ran back to help his colleagues, but found himself the target of the lion's attack. He squeezed off one shot, but only grazed the beast. The wounded animal pounced. A native bearer saved his life. But Livingston had been badly mauled and his arm was broken. It was a terrible experience. And it wasn't just broken, but you see it was, it was crushed as well. Miles from medical help, Livingston treated his own wounds. He even managed to insert a screw into the broken bone. I presume he was putting sticks, a splints around and tying it. And, you know, what he couldn't do, he'd be, you'd have somebody say, hold this and tie there and whatnot. Very painful. And, of course, very difficult to get a good, a good setting in that way. Weeks later, a fellow doctor inspected Livingston's wound with astonishment. He showed an amount of courage, sagacity, skill and endurance that have scarcely been surpassed in the annals of heroism. Such stories, published by Livingston and others, reached a wide audience in Europe and America. Readers were inspired not just for the sense of adventure, but with the feeling that they were joining the missionaries in an historic crusade. During the first three years of his travels, Livingston suffered 27 bouts of fever. He struggled across rivers and through tropical forests with a racing heart, agonizing headaches, dizziness and diarrhea. He was driven by his Christian ideals and a nearly messianic self-belief. After 15 years of exploration, Livingston made his most spectacular discovery. They came down this great broad river which spreads out to, oh, more than a mile wide there. And they came down and there's an island ahead and the water was flowing on either side and he said, are we gonna, are we gonna make this or are we gonna be swept to one side or the other? Then you land on the island, as he did, and looked over and you saw this huge fog, the largest curtain of water in the world. He felt this was a, a wonder of nature, a wonder of God's creation. He said, angels in their flight must have seen sights like this. Livingston named the site in honor of his queen, the Victoria Falls. Slavery had been banned throughout the British Empire in 1833, and the Royal Navy tried to intercept illegal slave runners bound for America. But the slave trade continued unchallenged in East Africa. Livingston was determined that Britain must rid the continent of what he called the open sore of the world. He concluded that the slavers must be tempted into more acceptable ways of making a living, that Africa must be civilized not by force, but by trade. Livingston appealed to the crusading spirit that thrived in Victoria's Britain, a spirit that was embodied in the new Houses of Parliament in the heart of the British capital. Prince Albert had spent the last 10 years of his life supervising the decoration of what he saw as a temple to civilized values. Good government, 
law, and the Christian religion. At the heart of the building was the robing room, where the queen would don the robes of sovereignty for the state opening of parliament. Here, in all its glory, was Prince Albert's vision of Camelot. The paintings he commissioned would be a permanent reminder of the legend of King Arthur. These heroic figures were to be role models for soldiers and scientists, the explorers and missionaries who would spread British values around the globe. But how to spread this vision remained a hotly contested question. In the House of Commons, this question was fiercely debated by Parliament's elected members led by two men whose views of Victoria's empire were diametrically opposed. On the one hand, the conservative Benjamin Disraeli, a passionate advocate of imperial power and glory. And on the other, his lifelong adversary, the liberal William Gladstone, who championed the moral vision of Prince Albert and David Livingston. Gladstone was driven by a sense of high moral purpose and a heavy burden of guilt, in part because his own family had once made a fortune from slave labor. As the leader of the Liberal Party, Gladstone campaigned for the export of civilized values through commerce, not conquest. Gladstone feels that the empire is there, there's not much you can do about it. He doesn't want to add to it, and he believes that imperialism is a creed which can contaminate the British people, uh, make them warlike, aggressive, um, whereas he thinks of a world in which there is universal peace. When he looks at imperialism, he says, is this godly? And he decides it isn't. He sees it as might somehow triumphing over right. And he's rather frightened if the British people get in trance with empire. They'll go gallivanting off, fighting wars here, there and everywhere, will spend a lot of money and cease to be a moral force in the world. This view was fiercely contested by his great rival, Benjamin Disraeli. Disraeli first moved into the Prime Minister's office in 1867, and for the next 15 years he and Gladstone would alternate in power. Disraeli believed in the expansion of the British Empire. He liked to claim that his ancestors had been rich Venetian merchants trading with the Orient, and this gave him a romantic enthusiasm for imperial adventures. Disraeli viewed the empire as an extraordinary asset. The empire made Britain a great power, a global power, and also enabled it to have plenty of muscle in Europe. And Disraeli, of course, likes the glamour of empire. He sees it uh, bestowing prestige on the country. He eventually hopes that the white colonies will not follow the American course, but remain emotionally tied to Britain, particularly through the person of the crown. But Victoria was still in deep mourning. Since the death of Prince Albert, she had lost interest in the empire and all other affairs of state. The Queen found some consolation with the Scotsman John Brown. She began writing about him a few months after Albert's death. I have an invaluable Highland servant who is my factotum here and takes the most wonderful care of me, combining the offices of groom, footman, page, and maid, I might almost say, as he is so handy about cloaks and shawls. I think she also enjoyed his uh, picking her up in his arms uh, and uh, putting her on her horse and taking her off her horse again for the first time since Albert. She had a strong, brawny man uh, who uh, held her in his arms. And I think that's as far as the sexuality really went, but she enjoyed it. To the dismay of her family and government, the queen and her Highland servant became inseparable. A section of press and public called her Mrs. Brown, and her absence from public duty was widely condemned. 
It was Disraeli who would rekindle the Queen's interest in public affairs. His relationship with Victoria had begun badly. She saw him as an upstart, an opportunist, what the British call a chancer. But Disraeli, with his considerable charm, set out to win her. His official dispatches to her were spiced with social gossip and witty anecdotes. Part of Disraeli's job as Prime Minister was to write an account of um, what was happening in Parliament and what was going on in the Cabinet to the Queen. And Disraeli's letters to the Queen were wonderfully detailed and rather gossipy and actually rather indiscreet. Um, he probably told the Queen far more than he ought to have done, particularly about divisions of opinion. Um, most people, made, uh, Prime Ministers, made these letters very brief and rather official. But Disraeli's letters to Victoria uh, were full of sort of protestations of affection and um, love and loyalty. They were largely sugar. But Queen Victoria lapped it up. Disraeli bewitched the Queen with his romantic vision of the British Empire. It would have horrified Prince Albert. Disraeli's first term as Prime Minister lasted less than a year. When he was voted out of office, the Queen had to send for the leader of the Liberals, Gladstone. Victoria began by liking Gladstone. He seemed to be an upright man. Uh, he was ambitious, but he was also extremely smart. Prince Albert had warmly approved of Gladstone. When the new prime minister came to the palace to receive the seals of office, the queen recorded her approval. He is very agreeable so quiet and intellectual, with such a knowledge of all subjects, and is such a good man. But her satisfaction did not last. Gladstone embarked on a whirlwind of liberal reforms that revived conservative instincts in the Queen that had been dormant while Albert was alive. Mr. Gladstone is a very dangerous man, and so very arrogant, tyrannical and obstinate, with no knowledge of the world or human nature. Gladstone was unconcerned by the Queen's personal disapproval of him, but he was appalled by the imperialist ideas she had picked up from Disraeli. His own more liberal views of Britain's role were confidently being put to the test in Africa. David Livingston had returned to his dark continent. This time he had been sent on an official mission to find a trading route into the interior and to achieve his dream of combining commerce, civilization, and the Christian religion. To this end, he was provided with generous funds by the British government and accompanied by six British scientists and his wife, Mary, herself a devoted missionary. Livingston believed that the Zambezi River could become a great highway for British industrial goods. But as they voyaged along the river, the expedition ran into dangerous rapids. He believed that the Zambezi could be a trade route. This great river, which he'd seen at Victoria Falls, but when he traveled down it, he missed out one or two sections. He took shortcuts. Well, that was a very reasonable thing to do. It saved a lot of time. But these shortcuts were quite impassable. And that's what the uh, Zambezi expedition found, that his hope of this being a great highway into the center of Africa wasn't there. Livingston refused to admit defeat. He kept up the search for a trading route. But then the expedition confronted another and more frightening peril. 
Despite repeated attacks of malaria, Livingston had dismissed the danger of disease. I apprehend no great mortality among missionaries, men of education and prudence who can, if they will, adopt proper hygienic precautions. But this optimism was to lead to tragedy. Mary Livingston was one of the first to go down with a fever. On the 29th of April, 1862, Livingston wrote to his mother, My beloved partner, whom I loved and treasured so much for 18 years, is with Jesus. She was a good wife, a good mother, and a good Christian. I feel greatly distressed and weep bitter tears. Livingston had paid a high price for his beliefs, and his grief would not end with the death of his wife. He had set out to civilize Africa through commerce, but back in England, popular enthusiasm for his exploits was generating a new hunger for conquest. Livingston's expedition had failed, disease had caused the deaths of 12 of his companions, and none of his objectives was attained. Livingston was recalled by the British government and returned home to face scathing attacks in the press. We were promised cotton, sugar, indigo, and we got none. We were promised trade, and there is no trade. We were promised converts, and not one has been made. In a word, Thousands subscribed by the universities and contributed by the government have been productive of the most fatal results. Israeli agreed with every word, and he soon seized the chance to promote his own vision of empire. When he won the next election, the Queen greeted his victory with delight. I saw Mr. Disraeli at quarter to three today. He knelt down and kissed hands, saying, I plight my troth to the kindest of mistresses. The silver-tongued charmer was back in office. As he had once confided to a friend, You have heard me called a flatterer, and it is true. Everyone likes flattery, and when you come to royalty, you should lay it on with a trowel. Disraeli always loved the company of women and he was very good at flattering women and I think with Queen Victoria he was able to see that she was lonely and Disraeli was able to charm her and to flatter her and I think very importantly one of the things that Disraeli did was to encourage her to take a far more active role in public affairs. The result of this was that basically he had Queen Victoria as um, an ally, particularly when he was Prime Minister. And this was absolutely crucial, I think, to the success of Disraeli's ministry, that the monarchy was behind it. Disraeli set out to increase Britain's prestige and expand Victoria's empire. And within a year of taking office, fate dealt him a brilliant opportunity. Just five years before, the Suez Canal had been carved through the Egyptian desert. It permitted ocean-going ships to pass between the Mediterranean and the Red Sea, linking Europe and the East. For Britain, it was the lifeline to her greatest imperial possession. India with 400 million people, was the largest overseas territory any empire has ever owned. The Queen called it the most precious jewel in her crown, and Israeli feared that a rival power would cut the new imperial artery. The shares in the Suez Canal Company were owned by a number of French investors and the ruler of Egypt, the Khedif. The Khedif had spent Egypt's wealth on palaces, museums, and railways. 
Now he was deep in debt to banks in London and Paris. The canal showed no prospect of paying a dividend for years, and he desperately needed funds. In 1875, he made a secret offer to the British. Disraeli wrote urgently to the Queen. Mr. Disraeli, with his humble duty to your majesty, the caitiff on the eve of bankruptcy appears desirous of parting with his shares in the Suez Canal and has communicated confidentially. It is an affair of millions, about four at least, but it is vital to your majesty's authority and power at this critical moment that the canal should belong to England. The caitiff now says that it is absolutely necessary that he should have between three and four million sterling by the 30th of this month. Scarcely a breathing time, but the thing must be done. The Queen replied by telegram the following day, approving his course of action, but fearing that it would be difficult to arrange. Normally, Parliament could have granted a government loan, but Parliament was not in session, and a French consortium had already bid for the shares. The Israeli sent his private secretary to seek help from an old friend. Baron Rothschild was the head of the great banking family and one of the richest men in the world. The secretary explained that the Israeli needed four million pounds, the price of the Kadiv shares in the Suez Canal. When? asked Rothschild. By tomorrow answered the secretary. Rothschild picked up a grape, spat out the pits and said, What is your security? The British government, was the reply. You shall have it, said the baron. The Israeli wrote to the queen in triumph, It is just settled. You have it, madam. The French government has been outgeneraled, and the entire interest of the Kediv is now yours. The Queen was delighted. Disraeli treated her not only as his monarch, but as a woman, and a woman of intelligence. When the canal deal was done, she wrote in her journal, Complete security for India. An immense thing. Mr. Disraeli said that my support had been a great help. His mind is so much greater, and his apprehension of things great and small so much quicker than that of Mr. Gladstone. Gladstone was strongly opposed to the deal because he thought it would draw Britain into new imperial commitments. He was right. The Suez Canal was to drag the British deeper and deeper into the murky politics of the Middle East. The overlords of the entire region were the Turks, but many of their subject peoples were rising against them. Faced with rebellion on all sides, the Turks resorted to mass slaughter. Russia backed the rebels and Israeli feared that the Turkish Empire would collapse and open the way for the Russians to advance on the Suez Canal. However badly they treated their subjects, Israeli thought Britain had to support the Turks. But Gladstone thought otherwise. He was no longer the leader of the Liberals. He had retired to his country estate where he relaxed by chopping trees and setting down his thoughts on God. But he was appalled by stories of Turkish atrocities against their Christian subjects. He thought the corrupt and crumbling Turkish Empire should be brought to an end. He laid down his axe and he took up his pen. There is not a cannibal in the South Sea Islands whose indignation would not arise and overboil at the recital of what has been done. Let the Turks now carry away their abuses in the only possible manner, namely by carrying off themselves. This thorough riddance, this most blessed deliverance, 
is the only reparation we can make to the memory of those heaps and heaps of dead, to the violated purity alike of matrons, maiden, and of child. The Israeli called the style of Gladstone's protest vulgar, remarking that of all the atrocities, Gladstone's writings were probably the worst. But Gladstone had caught the public mood, and in the House of Commons, Disraeli was forced to choose his words with more care. Our duty at this critical moment is to maintain the empire of England, nor will we agree to any step, though it may obtain for a moment comparative quiet and a false prosperity, that hazards the existence of empire. Disraeli backed his words with action. As the Russians advanced on the Turkish capital, he dispatched a British fleet, led by the most powerful battleship in the world, HMS Devastation. Public opinion swung to Disraeli's side. War fever spread through the pubs and music halls of Britain. The British may not have liked what the Turks were doing to their Christian subjects, but they shared Disraeli's determination to stop the Russians. Fearful of war with Britain, the Russians agreed to negotiate. Disraeli set off to attend peace talks. He returned in triumph. His diplomacy had forced the Russians to halt their advance on the Middle East. The lifeline to India was secure. Victoria shared the public rejoicing and decided it was the right moment to claim what she considered to be long overdue. In common conversation, I am sometimes called Empress of India. Why have I never officially assumed this title? I feel I ought to do so and wish to have preliminary inquiries made. Disraeli introduced a bill in Parliament to bestow on Victoria the title Queen Empress of India. Gladstone led the opposition, calling the move theatrical bombast and folly. But the title was granted and the Queen was delighted. She expressed her gratitude by making Disraeli an Earl. She was deeply grateful to Disraeli for this. It was, if you like, uh, embellishing the British monarchy and at the same time the Queen is given a new sense of responsibility. She is deeply interested in India. Uh, immediately she is made empress, she sets out to, to learn Hindustani. It doesn't make much headway, but there's a lot of, lot of goodwill there. And she also hires Indian servants. Between them, the Queen Empress and her newly ennobled Prime Minister appealed to an imperial spirit that was spreading through large sections of the British public. An aggressive spirit flexing British muscle and lording it over the world. Gladstone continued to oppose it. He called it showy imperialism. Even Disraeli's own foreign secretary wrote privately of his concerns. Disraeli believes thoroughly in prestige and would think it in the interests of the country to spend 200 millions on a war if the result was to make foreign states think more highly of us. The Queen backed Disraeli to the hilt. If we are to maintain our position as a first-rate power, we must, with our Indian Empire and large colonies, be prepared for attacks and wars somewhere or other continually. But the strain of this imperialist policy was beginning to show. British forces in southern Africa had clashed with the most powerful warrior nation on the continent, the Zulu. At the Battle of Isandlwana, 600 British soldiers were wiped out to a man. It took 17,000 British reinforcements, armed with the latest artillery, to defeat an enemy 
armed largely with spears. Back in England, a powerful voice was raised in protest. Remember the rights of the savage, as we call him. Remember Gladstone was no longer in control of Parliament, so he appealed directly to the British people. The power of his oratory drew vast crowds. 10,000 Zulus had died, he claimed. For no other offense than to defend against your artillery with their naked bodies. The Queen was outraged. She complained in her journal. Mr. Gladstone is going about like an American stomping orator, making most violent speeches. But to her surprise and dismay, Gladstone had struck a popular chord. Once more, he had appealed to the British sense of justice and fair play. They voted the Liberals back into power with a massive majority. Gladstone wrote exultantly of the defeat of Disraeli and the showy imperialism he represented. It is like the vanishing of some magnificent castle in an Italian romance. Prince Albert would have shared Gladstone's pleasure at the dismissal of Disraeli's warmongering government. But Victoria had turned her back on Albert's moral vision for the Empire. She stubbornly refused to accept Gladstone as her new Prime Minister. She wrote to her private secretary, The Queen will sooner abdicate than send for or have any communication with that half-mad firebrand who would soon ruin everything and be a dictator. Others but herself may submit to his democratic rule, but not the Queen. But she was a constitutional monarch, and submit she must. Gladstone returned to power, determined to reverse Disraeli's imperialist policies. He set out to achieve home rule for Ireland. He pressed for the appointment of more Indian judges, and ensured that Englishmen could no longer refuse to appear before them. But in Africa, Gladstone could do little to halt the public hunger for conquest, a hunger nourished by the further adventures of David Livingston. Livingston had returned to Africa to search for the source of the River Nile. For five years, he disappeared without a trace and his obituary even appeared in the press. There's no doubt that traveling in Africa had gone into his blood, but it was also, I think, he felt that if he succeeded in this, he would gain credibility again. He would show himself as the person who'd explored and found the source of the Nile. That would give credence to his views on slavery and the, the development of Africa through Christianity and commerce. But he was, at this time, more and more affected by illness. He was losing, he was losing blood. He would have attacks of malaria and dysentery. He had hemorrhoids, and he was a, a very, very sick man. A journalist, Henry Morton Stanley, was sent to Africa by an American newspaper with orders to find the lost missionary. Stanley fought his way through warring tribes, spurred on by reported sightings of Livingston. After seven months, he finally reached the remote trading post deep in the interior. Here, in November 1871, the famous meeting took place. Back to Livingston, I presume. Whether or not the immortal words were fact or fiction, Stanley had found his man. The news was telegraphed around the world. But when the headlines had faded, Livingston was still in Africa, alone, desperately lonely and increasingly unwell. 
close to death, he wrote a final letter beseeching the world to abolish the slave trade. All I can add in my loneliness is may heaven's rich blessing come down on everyone. American, English, or Turk, who will help to heal the open sore of the world. On the night of April 30th, 1873, David Livingston died. His body was wrapped in a shroud of tree bark and calico for its long journey back to England. But first, Livingston's servants cut his heart out and buried it under a tree so that it would always remain in Africa. When the body finally arrived in Britain, the Queen declared a day of national mourning. Livingston was buried in Westminster Abbey, and the words of his final letter were engraved on his tomb. But Livingston's African adventures had an effect he would never have endorsed. The opening up of the dark continent by missionaries, traders, and explorers launched a race for colonies that would become known as the Scramble for Africa. The pressure for British involvement in this land grab would shake all Gladstone's resolve to avoid further imperial commitment. It would bring Queen and Prime Minister to mutual loathing and ensure that the last act in the drama of Victoria's empire would be spectacular and bloody. Africa, the dark continent of the early explorers, became the stage for the final act in the story of Queen Victoria's empire. In the footsteps of missionaries like David Livingston, the powers of Europe conducted a brutal race for colonies, a race that would become known as the Scramble for Africa. In Britain, this last burst of expansion was inspired by two men whose stories would bring the British people to a climax of imperialistic fervor. The first, General Charles Gordon. Sent on a diplomatic mission to a poor Arab country, he launched a personal crusade to free an oppressed people. His defiant stand would draw his queen and her empire into a holy war and lead them on a romantic but violent quest to impose a new world order. The second, Cecil John Rhodes, started out as a simple cotton farmer, and he became the greatest empire builder of his generation. To fund his dreams of conquest, he embarked on a ruthless pursuit of diamonds, gold, and power that made him the most formidable and the most hated man in Africa. Between them, Cecil Rhodes and Charles Gordon exemplified the virtues and the vices of their age. They would lead the British to new heights of glory, and they would expose the dark underside of Victoria's empire. At the age of 60, Queen Victoria still wore the black satin and lace she had donned in mourning for her beloved husband, Prince Albert, who had died 20 years before. To her 350 million subjects across the world, she was the godlike symbol of British power and prestige. But in the winter of 1884, her empire faced a serious threat from one of the poorest and most obscure regions on Earth the Sudan. There is this saying among the Arabs, when Allah made the Sudan, he laughed. In Queen Victoria's time, most of its nine million people were nomads roaming a wilderness as large as Western Europe. The Sudan had no roads, 
no railways, and most of it was unmapped. Out of this wilderness came a prophet, an Islamic preacher who became known to the Arabs and then to the world as the Mahdi, the expected one. The Mahdi inspired the warlike tribes of the Sudan to rise up against their corrupt rulers. His armies swept through the country like the Samum itself, the notorious wind of the desert. Many in England soon feared that a jihad, or holy war, would sweep northward into Egypt and threaten the lifeline of the British Empire, the Suez Canal. Three quarters of the ships using the canal were British, and it formed a vital link to Victoria's richest possessions in India and the East. For this reason, British troops were stationed in Egypt to protect it. Now the Queen urged her Prime Minister, Gladstone, to use those troops against the Mahdi. The Queen feels very strongly about the Sudan and Egypt, and she must say she thinks a blow must be struck. These are wild Arabs, and they would not stand against regular troops at all. We must make a demonstration of strength. Gladstone did his level best to treat the Queen with courtesy, but he did not place great value on her judgment. Quite worthless. William Ewart Gladstone. He was one of the greatest statesmen of the Victorian age, a man of immense moral and physical strength. In his 70s, he relaxed by chopping down trees on his country estate. He believed that the strength of Britain's economy and the force of its liberal ideals could lead the world. He was a champion of human rights, and he believed in opposing tyranny. He was against the use of British troops to suppress what he saw as a popular uprising in the Sudan. But the press and public were of the Queen's opinion. They wanted action. Gladstone's government decided to play for time. They proposed sending a top army officer to the Sudan to report on the situation. For this mission, they chose one of the most popular heroes of the Victorian age, General Charles George Gordon. Gordon had made his name in China, where he had been sent to help defend British traders from the horrors of the Civil War. By all reports, Gordon was celibate and deeply religious. Wherever he went, he took the Bible and a generous supply of brandy. Since the war in China, he had led several campaigns in Africa. He had a reputation as a maverick who frequently disobeyed orders. This was the man the British government chose to send to the Sudan. Gordon got two sets of instructions. The first was to go there, find out what was really going on, and make a report as to whether the Mahdist rebellion could be, uh, could be handled, could be suppressed. And the other one was if that couldn't be done, then he was to report on how the European uh, traders in Khartoum could be evacuated. But of course, when he went there, because Gordon always went his own way, he decided to do something completely different. Gordon was dismayed by what he found in the Sudan. Men, women, and children were herded in chains across the desert for shipment to the great Arab slave markets, where the men were castrated and sold as eunuchs, and the women stripped and auctioned for service in the harems. Gordon assumed command in Khartoum and he made a bonfire of the notorious whips used by the slave traders and the Sudanese rulers to control their people. He was determined to be the savior of the oppressed Sudanese. I have come here without troops, but with God's help, we shall address the evils of the Sudan. First, Gordon would try to make an ally of the man he had been sent to confront, the Mahdi. He sent him a ceremonial uniform, 
offering personal friendship if the Mahdi would call an end to his holy war. Gordon now learned what manner of man he was dealing with. The Mahdi sent the uniform back with the patched jibba worn by the desert tribesmen and a note inviting Gordon to convert to Islam and join his army. Gordon realized that the Mahdi was a man, like himself, who could not be bought. A man who took his instructions from the Prophet, except that in the case of the Mahdi it was not the Prophet Isaiah, it was the Prophet Muhammad. Gordon then decided that the only way to deal with the Mahdi was to beat him in battle. His first step was to improve the city's defenses. He sent out patrols to find out what the Mahdist forces were up to, um, prepared stocks of ammunition, trained the troops, dug trenches. He did all the things that a professional soldier would do. Gordon took advantage of Khartoum's position, where the White Nile and the Blue Nile merge. He dug a defensive channel between the two rivers, sealing off the city. Then he sat back and waited for the Mahdi's attack. The Mahdi's forces cut the single telegraph link with Cairo and settled down to starve the city into surrender. Gordon was trapped in Khartoum with 35,000 men, women and children. To save them, he now had to have help from Britain. His strategic aim was to shame the British government into sending a force down to fight the Mahdi. And he was going to do that by hanging on until they had no option but to come and get him out. But in London, his request for help fell on deaf ears. It's the duty of the Gladstone was determined that Britain would not be dragged into a war in the Sudan. On the contrary, he sympathized with the Mahdi's struggle. Gladstone felt that the British Empire was already far too big and if anything should be contracted. But above all, he was the head of the government. and He simply wasn't going to be uh, dragged into a foreign war by some half-crazed um, royal engineer general who decided to uh, take over a town in the middle of nowhere and hold it, hold it against all odds. It wasn't part of the government policy. Gladstone told Parliament, To send troops would be a war of conquest against a people struggling to be free and struggling rightly to be free. But Gordon, trapped in Khartoum, had put the British government in a trap. After all, it had been their idea to send Gordon to the Sudan in the first place. And now this eccentric hero had captured the public imagination. They couldn't just leave him there to die. Besides, there was the Queen to reckon with. Victoria shared her people's fears for the safety of General Gordon. This handsome warrior seemed to embody all the martial and Christian virtues of her empire. From the besieged city, reports were smuggled out and taken down the Nile by steamboat. Soon, all England knew that Gordon stood alone in his quarters in the governor's palace, watching day after day for the British troops he hoped would be sent from Egypt. He wrote to the British consul in Cairo, How many times have we written asking for reinforcements? No answer at all has come to us, and the hearts of men have become weary at this delay. While you are eating and drinking and resting on good beds, we are watching night and day, endeavoring to quell the movements of this false Mahdi. Eight months into Gordon's mission, Gladstone finally cracked. He ordered the British army to invade the Sudan and bring Gordon out. But before they could reach Khartoum, Gordon's defenses began to crumble. On the morning of the 26th of January, 1885, the Mahdi launched his final assault. 
hordes of warriors poured through a gap in the city walls. Gordon hurried to the roof of the governor's palace. In the streets below, the people of Khartoum were being butchered by the Mahdi's forces. Gordon had a machine gun on the top of the, the palace, a, a gardener machine gun, rather like a Gatling. And he engaged the Mahdi's forces coming through the streets towards the palace with that until uh, they got too close and he couldn't depress the barrel of the gun anymore. When the Mahdi's warriors reached the palace walls, Gordon left the roof. Alone in his quarters, he put on his dress uniform and prepared to meet his fate. Accounts differ as to what happened next. By that time, the Mahdists had already killed the guards and swarmed into the gardens of the palace and were rushing towards him. Apparently, he arrived at the top of the steps just as the Mahdist spearmen and swordsmen arrived at the bottom and they just confronted each other. It's quite an amazing sight that they'd finally see in Gordon, the man they'd probably heard so much about, the, uh, the devil. There is the famous uh, picture, um, drawn presumably from accounts or simple fantasy, that the spearman rushed up the steps and sank a spear into Gordon's chest and he fell forward into the crowd and they cut him to pieces. This is the icon which uh, British artists quickly reproduced and uh, became, as you like, the first Christian imperial martyr. Uh, the men who actually saw him die 40 years later told the British officers in the Sudan that he'd in fact died firing his revolver in a corridor uh, in a skirmish. But he is much better, if you like, almost cinematographic to have him standing there, noble, upright, uh, champion of England, meeting his fate. Later that day, Gordon's head was shown to one of his officers who had been taken captive. Then it was fixed in the fork of a tree, where small boys pelted it with stones and camel dung. The Queen held Gladstone personally responsible. She wrote to her private secretary, Mr. Gladstone and the government have Gordon's innocent, noble, heroic blood on their consciences. No one who reflects on how he was sent out and refused help can deny it. She fired off a furious telegram to the Prime Minister who was on his way by train to London. Victoria's cables to her ministers were invariably sent in code, but not this one. This one could have been read by anyone on the telegraph line and it was intended as a public rebuke to the man who had failed her empire and its greatest hero. The telegram was presented to Gladstone by a country station master. These news from Khartoum are frightful. To think that all this might have been prevented and many precious lives saved by earlier action is too fearful. Gladstone, unswayed by public or royal hysteria, ordered the British Army to quit the Sudan. But Gladstone had misjudged the mood of the people and of Parliament. The death of Gordon fatally weakened his government. At the next election, he was voted out of office. Gladstone's fall from power was to have serious repercussions throughout the empire particularly in southern Africa. The absence of his moral influence cleared the way for a man who would lead Victoria's empire down a far more perilous path. Cecil John Rhodes had arrived in South Africa at the age of 17 to work on his brother's cotton farm. There was nothing to distinguish Rhodes from thousands of other British emigrants who left the mother country to seek their fortune in the British colonies. 
But this young clergyman's son would devote most of his life to expanding British rule and making himself the most dangerous man in Queen Victoria's empire. At first, his ambitions were limited to being a successful farmer. He got along well with his African workers, shared their food and hospitality, and respected their values. Rhodes had an intuitive feeling for the people of Africa. He was fascinated in African society. He would spend whole nights in kraals. He wanted to understand how they operate. He was quick to learn Zulu so he could communicate directly. He also understood the value that Africans placed on a person's trust. And he was much mocked by the other cotton farmers because he used to pay his labor in advance. And that was seen by the people who worked for him as a sign of trust and, of course, it built up their loyalty. But Rhodes was soon lured away from farming. His arrival in Africa had coincided with a fateful discovery 500 miles away on a remote farmstead known as Colesburg Kopi. A Dutch settler noticed his neighbor's children playing clip clip, or five stones. His eye was caught by a stone that shone with a particular brightness, and he went to take a closer look. The stone that the settler had spotted would be called the Eureka Stone, and it led to the richest source of diamonds ever found. Rhodes dropped everything, packed his bags, and joined the diamond rush. The farm at Colesburg Kopi soon became the boomtown of Kimberley. Roughnecks from the gold fields of California and Australia rubbed shoulders with veterans from the American Civil War, English aristocrats and immigrants from the ghettos of Europe, all drawn to a hole in the ground, which was growing bigger every day. To these men, Kimberley promised instant riches, but at a price. Kimberley was an indescribable place. The noise, the dust, the heat. If you can imagine this settlement of 40,000 people in the middle of nowhere, you could see the dust from the diggings from 10, 15 miles away. And as you came nearer, you entered this awful place. Huts built out of old packing cases, littered with dead animals, the carcasses of dead animals. Flies, infestations of flies. The Wild West was tame compared to Kimberley. Here there was a bar for every 16 men, and shootings were an everyday occurrence. But Rhodes thrived as a diamond digger. Within a year, he wrote to his mother that he was earning around 100 pounds a week, enough to make him one of the richest young men in England. But in 1872, just a few days after his 19th birthday, Rhodes suffered a heart attack. His doctors told him the attack was mild, but Rhodes knew that from then on, he was engaged in a race with death. He chose a curious form of convalescence, an epic trek across the African veldt. Some believe that during this journey, Rhodes developed his great love and his great plan for Africa. His health restored, Rhodes returned to the diamond fields. Most of the diggers thought that the diamond mine was exhausted and wanted to sell their claims. Rhodes took a gamble and bought them. His hunch was right. Beneath the first seam of diamonds was another, even richer. 
Rhodes put all the claims under the control of one company, De Beers. Within 10 years, it would own 90% of the world's diamond production. Rhodes would use his wealth to finance his dreams. Money is power, and what can one accomplish without power? Rhodes dreamed of creating a vast British colony across the length of Africa. To achieve this, he planned to build a railroad from Cape Town to Cairo. But first he needed to win political support in South Africa. He was elected to the Cape Parliament, where he courted the Africana Bon, the party of the Dutch farmers or Boers, who were consolidating their own power by taking it from the native Africans. We're talking at a stage when black people in the Cape voted, provided they fulfilled certain property requirements. They, they, they sat on juries where they sat in judgment over white people. This was abhorrent to the Africana Bont. And what Rhodes did was to form a very, very close alliance with them. Rhodes, who had once prided himself on his lack of prejudice, made a speech in the new Cape Parliament. Does this house think that it is right that men in a state of pure barbarism should have the vote? Treat the natives as a subject people. Be the lords over them. The native is to be treated as a child and denied the franchise. Following Rhodes' speech, the law was changed. The vote in southern Africa was removed from all but a handful of native Africans. Rhodes, throughout his career, was continually shifting the pieces on the board. Consider the diamond mines. If you go back to the beginning of that history, black people owned claims. They were competitors with whites. What Rhodes' requirements were was to have a permanent, reliable black labor force who would be kept within compounds, unable to leave at all, inspected every time they came out of the mines. And the need for a controlled labor force drove roads towards racist policies. If you try to make any political sense out of Rhodes's career, it makes absolutely no sense at all. But if you look at it in economic terms, it makes perfect sense. The alliances that he was making was for profit and for business, and there's no argument about it. The next step in Rhodes' master plan was to expand British territory northward into those regions David Livingston had explored years before. But across his route lay the empire of the Matabili, the people of the Long Shields, one of the most formidable warrior nations in Africa. Their king, Lobengula, known as the Eater of Men, maintained a reign of terror from his capital at Bulawayo, the place of slaughter. Gold had been discovered on his land and several European adventurers were after it. But Rhodes was after more than gold. He wanted Lobengula's country. The story of Rhodes and Lobengula is fascinating and it is foul. The two men never met and yet they had an extraordinarily strong relationship through intermediaries. Rhodes sent three of his agents to meet Lobengula, and in a bid to impress the Matabili king, he included among them the brother-in-law of the great David Livingston, John Moffat. But Lobengula was in no hurry to see them, and the men were forced to stay in an enclosure where the king kept his goats. There was a long, long wait for Rhodes' emissaries. Rudd particularly writes back about the appalling conditions, the mud, the flies, the stench, um, the impatience that they had there. They were kept waiting literally for months while Lobengula made up his mind. 
And finally, after all this waiting, Lobengula signified that he was willing to have a grand in Daba to discuss whether they would grant a concession to Rhodes' consortium. John Moffat presented Lobengula with a document that would grant Rhodes extraordinary powers. The complete and exclusive charge over all metals and minerals situated in my kingdom, principalities and dominions, together with full power to do all the things that they may deem necessary to win and procure the same. He eventually signed a document on the understanding that he was simply granting prospecting rights to Rhodes's company for his men to dig 10 holes in his territory. And what Lobengula had signed, he had virtually signed away his country. Armed with that document, Rhodes was able to go to London seeking a royal charter which would be Britain's endorsement of his rights to that territory. Rhodes was now famous. He was widely admired for his immense wealth and achievement. But many distrusted him as a man who would let nothing, not even the British government, stand in the way of his ambition. Rhodes won the Queen's approval and a royal charter authorizing him to exploit King Lobengula's concession. It gave him legal rights to recruit a company police force and build forts throughout the region, the powers of an independent state. But Rhodes still needed to break the power of Lobengula. To achieve this, he called on his closest friend, Dr. Leander Starr Jamison a gambler, an adventurer, and a ruthless opportunist. His chance came when Lobengula launched an attack on a weaker tribe in a dispute over cattle. Jamison sent a message to Rhodes. We have the excuse for a row over murdered women and children, and the getting of Matabili land would give us a tremendous lift in shares. Jamison recruited a force of 1,400 white mercenaries. Each man was promised 6,000 acres of Lobengula's land and 15 claims to prospect for gold. When Rhodes and Jamison between them decided that the time was ripe to take Matabili land, the key ingredient, the key weapon for them was the Maxim gun, the machine gun. Now this was a weapon that fired 60 bullets a second. This had never, never been used in battle before. And it's extraordinary that a company, a corporation, should possess the most top secret weapon, as it were, of the, that the British Army possessed. But Rhodes had Maxim guns. The Matabili were mainly armed with spears and clubs. The result was devastating. Rhodes's Maxim guns just cut through the advancing Matabili again and again and again. It was like scything grass. They didn't stand a chance. The losses were enormous, 3,000 on one day. Um, it was slaughter. Lobangula fled Bulawayo with his wives. A few days later, his abandoned ox cart was found with the king's body lying nearby. According to one of his followers, the great king of the Matabili had poisoned himself. John Moffat, who had persuaded Lobengula to sign the mining concession, was stricken by remorse. The king was a gentleman in his way, and was foully sinned against. In November 1893, Dr. Jamison hoisted the company flag over Bulawayo. Rhodes now had personal control over a vast territory that was to be called Rhodesia. A few days later, 
he made his triumphant entry into Lobengula's former capital and congratulated his troops on their destruction of what he called a ruthless barbarism. John Moffat now had a complete change of heart. The great Rhodes is prancing around. Everyone here is bowing down and worshipping him as the wisest of men. The popular tide is with him. I suppose there will be a crash someday, and men will suddenly recollect that there is still such a thing as justice, even to niggers. Rhodes' reward was to be elected the Prime Minister of Cape Colony. He bought a house on the slopes of Table Mountain overlooking the two oceans, the Indian and the Atlantic. Here he surrounded himself with his male friends and enlightened them with his religious and racial theories. Whites have clearly come out on top in the struggle for existence. Within the white race, the English-speaking man has proved himself to be the most likely instrument of the divine plan to spread justice, liberty and peace over the widest possible area of the planet. Therefore, I shall devote the rest of my life to God's purpose and help him to make the world English. Rhodes was master of all he surveyed, but he wanted more. His lust for power would soon plunge Victoria's empire into its darkest hour. In 1886, gold was discovered in the Transvaal, a state established by some of the Boers to escape British rule. Rhodes feared that the Transvaal Boers, enriched by revenues from gold mines, would become an obstacle to his plan. If they joined forces with German colonists in the west, they would block his route to the north. To avoid this, Rhodes formed an alliance with disgruntled miners in the gold town of Johannesburg and planned an uprising to overthrow the Boers. Jamison assured Rhodes, Anyone could take the Transvaal with a dozen revolvers. So Rhodes devised a plan to take the Transvaal by force. And these were the elements. That the people of Johannesburg would rise up in revolution. They would call for assistance, and Jamison would respond to that call with a group of mercenaries and Rhodesian police, and as it were, take the country. The promised uprising failed to materialize, but Jamison continued with the plan. He rode into the Transvaal at the head of his men. But the Boers were ready for them. They let the invaders ride on until they were surrounded, and then picked them off with murderous accuracy. According to the Boer commander, many of Rhodes' raiders were boys in their late teens, and many were weeping. The Jamison raid into the Transvaal was widely regarded as an unprovoked attack on an independent state, a naked act of aggression. It sent shockwaves around the world. Rhodes was forced to resign as Prime Minister of Cape Colony and he was summoned to London to answer to the British Parliament. But he had nothing to fear. Public opinion in Britain was increasingly anti-Boer. The Queen expressed the popular mood in a letter to her daughter. The Boers are a horrid people, cruel and overbearing. Rhodes had set Britain on a dangerous course. His violent and unscrupulous methods provoked a reaction that shook the empire to its core. And this at a time when the queen was preparing to celebrate the glories and triumphs of her reign. 
1897 was the year of Victoria's Diamond Jubilee, 60 years on the throne. Soldiers and colonial leaders from all over the empire came to London to take part in a spectacular parade. It was recorded by the new movie cameras. A little old woman under the umbrella now ruled over a fifth of the population of the planet. A never-to-be-forgotten day. No one ever, I believe, has met with such an ovation as was given to me. The cheering was quite deafening, and every face seemed to be filled with real joy. But this joy would soon turn to disillusionment, as soldiers who had paraded the streets of London were sent to fight a war in South Africa. The British dispatched an army to accomplish what Rhodes had failed to do, put an end to Boer independence. The Boer War began just a year after the Queen's Jubilee. The British believed it would be short and glorious, but the Boers were well armed. One English private wrote in his diary, As soon as we started to advance, the bullets began to fly. All of a sudden, a maxim began to play upon us. That stopped the firing line. For flat on their faces, they fell, and devil of a move would they make at all. The British have gone to war in South Africa, very ill-prepared for this type of warfare. Most of the generals who, who fought the Boers were, were used to people armed with spears and lances. Well, it was a shock for them. There were instances of surrender. People couldn't take it any longer. They just threw down their weapons um, and, and ran back. There were cries of cowardice. Successive defeats shattered the confidence of the British public. Even the staunch Victoria was shaken. The war touched her personally when her own grandson, Prince Christian Victor, was numbered among the dead soldiers. The British stepped up their war effort. They shipped a quarter of a million troops to southern Africa. Slowly the tide turned against the Boers. The Boer armies were defeated, but their young commandos continued a vicious guerrilla war. In retaliation, the British Commander-in-Chief, General Kitchener, pursued a war of attrition, burning farmsteads and rounding up women and children. He interned them in the world's first concentration camps. Large numbers of Boer civilians are exposed to typhus and cholera, and the result are death camps, which the British press uh, and various British uh, liberals take a great interest in and expose as a barbaric methods of warfare. The mood of the Queen and the public remained stoutly patriotic, but the disasters of the Boer War fed a growing disillusionment from which the imperial ideal would never recover. Cecil Rhodes, the man who had done more than any other to start this war, had one more battle to fight. His heart condition made it difficult for him to breathe. He was carried to his little cottage on the coast in the hope that the fresh sea breezes would relieve his anguish. But here, at the age of 48, he finally lost his race with death. He had left orders that he was to be buried in Rhodesia, at a spot he called the View of the World. His grave was marked not with a cross, but with a massive stone. It was, in the words of a British High Commissioner, a haunted, sinister, pagan place. Many of the attitudes that Rhodes had embodied were buried with him. The era of Victoria was over. 
and with it the unquestioning imperialism she had come to represent. Queen Victoria died in the evening of January 22, 1901. She was 81 years old. On her own instructions, she was dressed in white. Spring flowers were sprinkled over her body. Her face was covered by the veil she had worn at her wedding with Prince Albert 60 years before. Queen Victoria's death was seen by many as the passing of an era. But also in 1901, there were fears that other powers were rising up, which might start to put pressure on Britain uh, to yield its primacy in the world. So that uh, the last days of the Queen's reign, there were fears and misgivings. Rhodes had overstretched the empire. The Boer republics he had driven Britain to conquer were soon given independence. His aggressive spirit was to be replaced by a Gladstonian liberalism. Those ideals that Prince Albert had instilled in Victoria in the early years of her reign proved in the end to be more enduring than the harsh imperialism of her final decade. Despite running the most powerful nation on earth, throughout her reign, Queen Victoria always found time for her journal. She used her pen therapeutically to express her innermost thoughts, which is why her writings are so much more than just a record of events. Many of them are kept at the Royal Archives at Windsor Castle. Oliver Urquhart Irvin is the librarian there, it isn't easy to decipher her handwriting, but it's worth the effort. Here in widowhood, she recalls happy times with Prince Albert. But look, here we are, December the 27th, 1860, at Windsor. Sir. My angel always drove me from a seat behind, Hand. sitting okay. astride with his feet in large, large boots, boots and his fur-lined coat with fur gloves. Yeah. And he enjoyed it so much, and it was so pretty. Yes, that's a very touching one, actually. That's when she's in the first throes of grief and she's writing out happy memories. The noiseless moving of the sledge. It's almost like a Russian novel, isn't it? If Victoria's works were to be bound as a collection, there would be some 700 volumes, more than 50 million words. The volume, I mean, it's colossal, isn't it? Uh, the volume of correspondence, uh, of writing of papers, is, of course, colossal as one would expect to find Victoria's writings in almost every archive in the world uh, and in many personal and private archives. Indeed, yes. Um, Specifically thinking of the journal, actually, which is enormous, isn't it? It is indeed enormous, yes. <laughs> Once she'd begun this habit, perhaps prompted by her mother, of keeping a journal, it became a habit for the rest of her life. Yes, we're very fortunate that, uh, indeed, that she kept such a journal. It provides a fantastic, observational, vivid and honest account of, uh, of her life. It's an extraordinary survival. Of course, the later volumes, Princess Beatrice's, are in her hand rather than Queen Victoria's. Victoria was never afraid to speak her mind. And we don't know whether she'd have wanted her diaries edited. Oliver, however, has no doubts. Why did Princess Beatrice copy her mother's journals rather than just leaving the mother's journals as they were. But well, she was asked to. Um, by whom? By her mother. If you bear in mind that the diaries were written for Queen Victoria by herself and not necessarily with posterity in mind, there came a realisation towards the end that some exercise in editing, perhaps even reduction in some places, to avoid offending members of the family or others indeed, uh, where Queen Victoria had, at the moment of writing, felt able to be fully and freely expressive. The sweetness and spiciness of what survived her edit simply stokes our interest in what Beatrice cut out. How much more was there, for instance, about the fraught relationship between the Queen and her mother? The dynamics of the first relationship Victoria ever knew deeply affected her whole life. It is said that the death of Prince Albert in 1861 was the greatest tragedy of Queen Victoria's life. But it wasn't the first. The death of her mother, nine months earlier, 
provoked a tsunami of emotions which stirred up intense inner conflicts. It is dreadful. Dreadful to think we shall never see that dear, kind, loving face again. The outbursts of grief are fearful and at times unbearable. As she wrote these loving words, Victoria was rewriting her own history. Since her teens, she'd loathed her mother, the Duchess of Kent. On becoming queen, she'd moved her out of her court and shunned her. They'd barely spoken properly for years. But when her mother died in March 1861, Victoria suddenly realized what she'd lost. As most children do when their parents are dying, Victoria sorted through her mother's effects. Amongst them, small pink love notes written to Victoria when she was a young girl and placed under her pillow. My dearest, beloved Victoria, let me say a few words to you before you shut your dear little eyes. In some hours, this year is closed. Let us thank the great and almighty God for all the many blessings we experienced this year. Well, you can imagine with what shock Victoria read these letters in grown-up life after her mother had died. Since she and her mother had become estranged, Victoria had told herself that her mother had been unkind, that she'd had an unhappy childhood. And here was visible, tangible evidence that her mother had adored her and that there had been many periods of joy in her childhood. She had the letters bound up in this magnificent leather volume and pricked out on the cover the words, From Dear Mama. She was born in May 1819 at Kensington Palace, but it might as well have been in Germany. Her mother was German, Princess Victoria of Saxe-Coburg-Saalfeld. She barely spoke English. She was the widow of Prince Charles of Leiningen. Victoria's father was her second husband, the Duke of Kent, but he was to die just eight months after Victoria arrived. That she never knew her father was arguably the single most important factor in Victoria's psychology. The Queen would spend her life searching for a father figure. Widowed a second time, the Duchess of Kent was by royal standards impoverished. Her brother-in-law, King William IV, allowed her to carry on roughing it rent-free here at Kensington Palace, where she fell prey to the ambitious John Conroy. Historian Kate Williams has chronicled events at Kensington Palace. She really needed someone to depend on, and Conroy stepped in, he saw the vacuum really, stepped in and made it his own, and really pretty much made himself almost king. For little Victoria, looking for a kindly man to play papa, Schema Conroy was a disaster. In diaries written in adulthood, she paints him as a sort of pantomime villain, and her childhood as miserable. I led a very unhappy life as a child. Had no brothers and sisters, never had a father, was not on comfortable or at all intimate or confidential footing with my mother. These words, written when she was a grown-up, paint a pretty bleak picture. But the truth was more nuanced. Yes, she was a poor fatherless girl who for the rest of her life craved male attention. Yes, Sir John Conroy was a bully and a cad. Yes, the Duchess of Kent was a silly goose. And between them, the Duchess and John Conroy devised something they called the Kensington system. It meant total separation from the court, and here, in Kensington Palace, it meant that the child was never alone. She shared a bedroom with her mother. She never ate anything which hadn't been tasted first. She wasn't allowed on this staircase unless she was accompanied. The Kensington system was really a way in which the Duchess of Kent and John Conroy, in particular Conroy, wanted to control Victoria. This vision that she would come to the throne at 12, 13, and they'd be in charge. And Conroy, presumably, was the chief agent of this system. 
The Duchess of Kent was a woman who really was out of her depth. She was out of her depth in Britain. She knew the royal family hated her. She couldn't really speak English. When Conroy came along, he said, you know, I can see an opportunity here. And so Victoria, this tiny, plump little child, this really little toddler, she's everyone's passport to glory, to riches, to massive grandeur. It was a repressive regime. But while Victoria's diaries recall a lonely childhood, we must remember she was prone to reinterpreting her own story. Deirdre Murphy is curator of the Victoria Revealed exhibition at Kensington Palace. So this is the room that Princess Victoria was supposedly born in. Oh, she was born here? Yeah. Yes, she was born in this room. One of her dolls' houses? Yes, from the late 1820s. And she had lots of dolls. She had lots of dolls. She made them herself with her governess, Baroness Leitzen, and together had lots of fun dressing them. There were animals. She had a beautiful looking Charles Spaniel named Dash. She would play with him in the gardens and every now and then would dress him up in costumes. <laughs> she did have quite a happy childhood when she looked back on it. She saw it as unhappy. And I wonder whether you think, in fact, it was the bullying of Conroy when she was a teenager that led her to have this view. I completely agree with that. These memories that she brings back throughout her life later on are not necessarily reliable because she changes her view from time to time. So in, in 1872, her eldest daughter Vicky is marrying and having children. She writes to Vicky about how difficult her childhood was, giving her advice about how to cheat, treat her own children. And this is a theme that marks through her letters and correspondence. But we clearly can't rely on that completely because she clearly had fun here. She was indulged and had a pretty good deal, actually. At half past six, we went to the play to Drury Lane. It was Shakespeare's tragedy of King John. The principal characters were King John and Mr. McCready, who acted beautifully. We came to the very beginning and stayed to the very end. I was very much amused. Her mother and Leitzen and Victoria were stage struck, and they often came here to the glitzy London West End. The Theatre Royal Drury Lane was one of their favorites, to the play, to the opera, to the ballet. You and I, to give ourselves a treat, might go to the opera or the ballet two or three times a year. Victoria, as a teenager, went to the opera two or three times a week. Victoria's family ruled in turbulent times. Her uncle, King William IV, was the last monarch to appoint his own prime minister in defiance of parliament. The people demanded changes to the corrupt electoral system, and sweeping reforms in 1832 did little to dispel the scent of revolution in the air. Trapped in Kensington Palace, Princess Victoria was ignorant of it all. What Victoria did come to realize, however, was the future that awaited her. There were no other legitimate heirs to the throne. This young girl, three quarters German, was next in line. And didn't Conroy and the court know it? They knew that whoever influenced this child influenced the future British head of state. Which is why, when she was 13, Conroy and her mother took Princess Victoria on a tour across the country. They sensed that if the monarchy were to survive, it must be more visible. Free from the claustrophobic atmosphere of Kensington, Victoria found herself exposed to the world outside, a world of industrial change and burgeoning unrest. Instead of the safety of the nursery with her dolls, she found herself looking into the faces of the poor, grimy with smoke and soot. And she wrote about her experiences in her journal, given and read by her mother. We have just passed through a town where all coal mines are, and you see the fire glimmer at a distance in the engines in many places. The men, women, children, country and houses are all black. Professor Jane Ridley has written a life of the Queen. It's quite interesting. Uh, she was sent on those tours which she rather hated around England and the pressure she was under I think is quite extreme I think it might account for why she actually hated appearing in public later on in life I think her mother saw keeping a journal as part of the training of being a monarch 
It's fascinating. So it was, in a sense, part of the Kensington system, the show? I would say it was. I saw a diary of somebody who was at one of these things in Plymouth, and this person noticed that at dinner, uh, the little princess didn't say anything. She just looked round the table all the time. She kept looking, looking. And they asked afterwards, you know, what's wrong with this child? Why, did she, why was she looking at all the people? Uh, and Conroy said, she's been trained to remember who they are. Uh, and when she gets back, she'll be tested on them by her mother. And if you look at the entry in the diary, you see a long, long list of names, none of whom she could have named, none of which could have made any sense to her at all. It's hard to say exactly when, but by her early teens, the princess had come to see what her mother and Conroy were up to. Victoria was coming to realize her position as a pawn in the political power game. And she came to feel that her mother was siding with Sir John Conroy against her. Things came to a head here in the seaside town of Ramsgate on a fateful day in autumn 1835 when her hatred of Conroy was confirmed and she came to lose her mother. It was after a tour of the north. Victoria was exhausted and sickly when they arrived here at the Albion Hotel. She had a very sore throat and she became ill. The doctor came, the doctor went, said she was all right. Her mother refused to believe her, thought she was just making a fuss. Conroy said she was shamming. So this goes on for several days, Victoria getting quite dangerously ill. Where artisans are now creating a new bijou hotel, Victoria lay in her bed at a low ebb. John Conroy seized his opportunity. He clumsily barged into her bedroom and tried to make her sign away her future powers as queen. His idea was to have a regency, with the Duchess of Kent ruling in Victoria's stead and, of course, John Conroy ruling the Duchess. Sick as she was, the 16-year-old, backed up by her governess, Louise Leitzen, refused Conroy. It would seem that Sir John was all but violent with her. I resisted in spite of my illness and their harshness, my beloved Leitzen supporting me alone. From now on, Victoria was just waiting to be 18 and rid of the influence of Conroy and her mother. She began to forget her happy childhood and dwell only on the sad things. The experience at Ramsgate had poisoned her childhood memory and fueled her resentment against her mother. The myth of the totally unhappy childhood was born. But Victoria was also possessed of a sense of destiny. She knew that Uncle William wasn't going to be alive for much longer. The king had fathered 12 children, but no living legitimate heir. In June 1837, he died in his sleep of a heart attack. Her mother woke Victoria. I got out of bed and went into my sitting room, only in my dressing gown, alone, and saw them. Kneeling before her, the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Lord Chamberlain were now her subjects. Victoria, more German than British, was now queen. She was ready to throw herself into the role. The survival of the monarchy itself depended on her success. I am very young, and perhaps in many, though not in all things inexperienced, but I am sure that very few have more real goodwill and more desire to do what is fit and right than I have. Victoria was now free of the Kensington system and all it represented. But she was just 18 years old, and she needed help to be head of state. Luckily, help was at hand in the form of somebody who himself needed human companionship. Her aristocratic Whig Prime Minister, Lord Melbourne. <laughs> Cometh the time, cometh the father figure. Melbourne was everything that Conroy wasn't. He was loving, kind, and emotionally intelligent. He saw what she needed, and he lavished it on her. In her diary, Queen Victoria had described herself as the little fatherless girl 
Now the 58-year-old Prime Minister made sure she felt in control, but safe in his care. It was he who prepared Victoria and who staged managed the momentous coronation here at Westminster Abbey in June 1838. Since 1066, almost every English monarch has been crowned here. Victoria had been raised to be ready for this pivotal moment in her own life and that of the nation since her birth. There was a two-day fair in the park. There were illuminations. There was a firework display. There were people swarming into central London to see their new queen. She was woken at 4 a.m. by the booming of the guns in the park. And yet, she doesn't mention her mother once when she came to write it up in her journal. The central figure for Victoria on her coronation day was Lord M. My excellent Lord Melbourne, who stood very close to me throughout the whole ceremony, was completely overcome at this moment and very much affected. He gave me such a kind and, may I say, fatherly look. First things first, Victoria wanted to get rid of Sir John Conroy. Conroy realised that his luck had run out. He wanted to cash in his chips. He claimed that Victoria had privately offered him a huge pension of £3,000 a year and an English peerage. Well, Melbourne wasn't having any of that, though he did offer Conroy an Irish peerage which was refused. The influence of Conroy was now decisively over. There is no end to the amusing anecdotes and stories Lord Melbourne tells, and he tells them all in such an amusing and funny way. The passionate friendship which sprang up between them gave to the young queen the security she craved, and to Melbourne, reeling from a shattered marriage, someone to care for. Really, every day he was with us, sometimes for five hours a day, they'd ride together, they'd do jigsaws together, they'd play cards together. He participated in all of this, and through this constant being by the Queen's side, he gained a lot of influence, a lot of power, and essentially, he could really tell her what her role was. So, what he had was something people envied incredibly. Her education started here. The journals bubble with her conversations with Lord M. They talked of everything under the sun, from French history to Shakespeare, from mixed race marriages to Whig society gossip. It wasn't just a political process that Lord M introduced her to, it was life itself. Her relationship with Melbourne was helped along by a charming weakness on the part of the Queen. She always fell for men who made her laugh. The flirty, fun-loving teenage queen leaps from her pages. I asked Lord M how he liked my dress. He said he thought it very pretty and that it did very well. Talked to my having taken a bath, his seldom doing so. Talked to my having wished to roll in the grass when I was in the garden, which made him laugh. As a young man, he had been outstandingly good-looking. And he still is. He was incredibly charming. He knew everybody. He takes upon himself not just to sort of educate the young queen but also to act in effect as her private secretary her journals during the melbourne years are fascinating because she wrote down absolutely everything that he said melbourne more than anybody is making her a british queen politically speaking the relationship between queen victoria and lord melbourne had no significance whatsoever lord m was absolutely out of sympathy with his own times and while the pair were out together laughing and writing the country was in a state of unease. Great riots had broke out at Birmingham again. Houses burned and others plundered, which he, Lord M, feared was to be expected. Melbourne protected Victoria, but the national movement for working class emancipation that produced the People's Charter couldn't be ignored. There was trouble with the sugar trade. And then in 1839, a parliamentary defeat over Irish independence forced Melbourne to resign. She'd felt safe, secure and much loved. Now she felt alone, exposed. It was almost as though he died. 
all my happiness gone, that happy, peaceful life destroyed, that dearest, kind Lord Melbourne, no more my minister. The Prime Minister's replacement was the Tory Sir Robert Peel. He had no charm, no sense of humour, and he couldn't flirt. Lord M's charm had given him power over Victoria. Peel's lack of it almost guaranteed a battle of wills. Their first meeting sparked a constitutional crisis. Peel almost immediately said, you've got to change your ladies. The ladies of the robes, the ladies of the bedchamber, they once are Whigs, they now have to be Tories. And Victoria, she couldn't cope with this. She said to Peel, I'm not changing my ladies. I am not doing this. Peel surprised her by saying, in that case, he wouldn't be her prime minister. It became known as the bedchamber crisis. Robert Peel was a very astute politician. By refusing to be prime minister, he demonstrated quite a lot of things to the world at large. He demonstrated that Victoria was a Whig partisan. He'd also demonstrated that she was trying to exercise the kind of monarchical power which no longer existed in Britain. This was the last time the British monarch ever openly defied uh, a represented politician. Victoria felt victorious, but her intransigence pointed up her immaturity. That she put her own selfish needs before those of Parliament was visible to all, and the ramifications were immense. Peel's refusal to serve created a vacuum. Melbourne was forced to return as Prime Minister of a weak Whig government, which lasted just two more years. The political system had been shaken by a young girl's tantrum, the sort of behaviour a more enlightened mother might have influenced if she'd been more present in Victoria's life. The Duchess was now very much behind the scenes, but she was nevertheless quietly engineering her daughter's future and her own. The question on everybody's lips was, who was the young queen going to marry? And broadly speaking, there were three options. She could have married her cousin in England, George, Duke of Cambridge, who was a soldier her age. They were fast friends throughout their lives, but George used to say rather ungallantly he'd never wanted to marry plain little Victoria. Old William IV had wanted her to marry into the Dutch royal family, but Victoria was having none of that. The two eligible princes of Orange were frightful oafs. And then there was the third option, favoured by Uncle Leopold, King of the Belgians, and by her mother. And that was that she should forge a political alliance with her Coburg cousin, Prince Albert. Since 1714, the English Hanoverian royal family had been German. Victoria was by descent a member of this family, but her mother was of a different line, the Saxe Coburg Gotas, and so was Albert. They saw in this marriage a chance for the family effectively to take over the running of Great Britain. They had met before as teenagers. 17-year-old Albert and his brother Ernest had encountered Victoria at a family get-together in England. Ernest was taller and funnier. Dr. Karina Orbach is a biographer of Queen Victoria. The first time he came over with, uh, with his brother Ernest, she thought that Ernest was the more interesting one because that was the lively one and the, the fun-loving one. But when they met the second time round, um, then of course he, he had become a quite good-looking man and it was a very a hormonal decision for her to marry him. In autumn 1839, the bright-eyed prince, now 20, came for a visit from Germany. And Victoria, three months older, nearly a foot shorter, was completely smitten by him. Albert really is quite charming and so excessively handsome. Such beautiful blue eyes and exquisite nose and such a pretty mouth with delicate moustaches and slight but very slight whiskers. A beautiful figure, broad in the shoulders and a fine waist. My heart is quite going. Knowing with hindsight how much rested on that meeting, it's hard not to feel a little awestruck by the innocence of Victoria's emotions when she first set eyes on the youthful Albert. They were destined to become the grandparents of Europe, one of the most famous couples in history. <laughs> 
that the path ahead was not going to be an easy one. Victoria was extremely vulnerable emotionally. She was also the most eligible princess in Europe, or in the world. As she swooned, she unconsciously fell in with plans laid by a grand master of political manoeuvring, Prince Albert's equivalent of Lord Melbourne. This was never intended to be a love match. Of course, Albert was going to support his wife, but he wanted to influence her politically. Guided himself by his own political mentor, Freiherr Dr. Stockmar of Coburg, they wanted to establish constitutional monarchy as the principal bulwark against revolution in Europe. And the best way of doing that was to marry the British Queen and have a large family. So Albert took this marriage on as a challenge. And he knew it would be tough because that's what Stockmar told him when he was about to go to England the second time. He said, do you want to do this? This is going to be a hard life. You know, you will have to um, help this, this woman in distress. That's how he sold Victoria. Albert was a controller and a cold fish. But from the first, they were passionately and physically in love. Dearest Albert took my face in both his hands and kissed me most tenderly and said, Ich habe dich so lieb. Ich kann nicht sagen wie. I love you so much. I cannot say how much. She was so besotted by Albert, by his beauty and talent, how he could play the piano, dance, and talk about her favorite opera, that she hardly realized how much of her own freedom and personality she was surrendering when she asked him to marry her. And marry, they did. We both went to bed, of course in one bed, to lie by his side and in his arms and on his dear bosom and be called names of tenderness I have never yet heard used to me before. <sighs> this was the happiest day of my life. There's no doubt that there was a strong sexual attraction. I think so, yes. Yes, definitely. When one reads her diaries, one is um, impressed by her um, openness. I mean, she, she really says how beautiful he was and how wonderful it is to be touched by him and things like and that. And after so. they got married, she enjoyed him taking off her stockings, putting on her stockings. Yes, having intimacy so for the, the first time. Yes. So she was utterly delighted by him yes. in a physical way. That was lucky. That was lucky. Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> The Duchess of Kent was not so lucky. Victoria was now no longer a child and felt able to flex her muscles for all to see. She shunned her mother. The Duchess of Kent was a woman destroyed. She couldn't believe that Victoria didn't want to see her. Victoria wanted to get away from her mother at every opportunity, and the whole court saw this. Victoria confided in her journal her ongoing coldness to her mother. It has been observed that after the marriage, I kissed the Queen Mother and only shook hands with Mama, which I said was true. It's heartrending to read the cry of the rejected mother seeking the approval of the callous daughter. In the year after Victoria married, her mother wrote to her, Oh, Victoria! Why are you so cold and indifferent with your mother, who loves you so dearly? But the Queen had eyes for Albert and Albert alone. He appeared to be her dream come true. Victoria was in raptures. Her mother, who planned the whole thing, was sidelined. Victoria took a lease of £2,000 a year on this house, 36 Belgrave Square, and she dumped her mother in it. It's handy for the palace. I can see the trees of the garden of Buckingham Palace from where I'm standing. But the Duchess of Kent was very definitely outside the palace. Here was her place, and her daughter had firmly put her in it. What Victoria wanted now was solitude, romance, and excitement in company of her man and Superman, Prince Albert. They fled to the most romantic part of the British Isles and furthest from the London court. <laughs> 
Soulful Albert was already homesick, and the landscape and even the people reminded him of his German homeland. Victoria, too, loved the Highlanders. She enjoyed their lack of deference, how they treated her as if she was a human being. There was a quiet, a retirement, a wilderness, a liberty, and a solitude that had such a charm for us. You can hear the relief in Victoria's words, her joy at being out of London and away from state's duties. They both loved the great outdoors, Victoria and Albert. He liked doing deer stalking. She was a very good watercolorist and liked to take her sketchbook out onto the hills. Gilly, Sandy Reed, knows the places that made her heart sing. So what were her favorite views when she was around here? Well, I think at one time she just loved to go on her picnics and Tullock, the hill over on her right there. Uh, that was her favorite picnic spot. She would get on the pony, uh, ride side saddle up the hill, and Albert, would he would go off stalking, and uh, she would just wait. And her, they would have a picnic waiting for him coming back again. Have you heard whether Prince Albert was a good shot or not? Uh, well, I don't think he was really a good shot, like, you know, but... Was he not? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he always seemed to have uh, what you would call hard luck. In the evenings, they would retire to the homes of the Scottish nobility for whiskey and flings. I danced several quadrilles and valses, finishing up with a galop with Albert. Ah, oh, the innocence of young love. But they were in for an extraordinary journey together. Neither of them wanted to surrender their independence. Both wanted power. And more than is the case in most marriages, there were to be some furious clashes of wills. Initially, Albert thought he'd won because Victoria said she'd obey him in the marriage ceremony. But that was just for show. Victoria saw Albert as a helper. Nothing better in her vision. She was writing letters and Albert was getting the blotting paper. That was his role. He wanted to be king. He wanted to have power. Albert wanted control. And all he had to do was to let nature take its course. Within a month of the wedding, Victoria was pregnant. And when she first fell pregnant, she was pretty miserable. She just thought, this has happened so quickly. And she wrote to Uncle Leopold, who was thrilled and so excited, said, I, if I have a nasty girl at the end of all my trials, I'll drown it. Victoria was conflicted. She adored Albert, and he wanted more children. But with every pregnancy, she had to give him more executive power. And he hadn't reckoned on her fury. After she gave birth to the Princess Royal, Vicky, she suffered from terrible postnatal depression, and there was a most awful row with Prince Albert. There is often an irritability in me, she wrote, which makes me say cross and odious things which I don't myself believe and which I fear hurt Albert. Albert just couldn't cope with the swings of emotion and with the rows, and he wrote in despair to old Dr. Stockmar, who was both a medical doctor as well as his political advisor, for advice. Victoria is too hasty and passionate for me to be able often to speak of my difficulties. She will not hear me out, but flies into a rage and overwhelms me with reproaches of suspiciousness, want of trust, ambition, envy. She was at once furious and adoring. She missed the brief but golden period when Albert was hers alone. She was jealous of the children on whom he lavished his attention. She hated being pregnant and she hated, she, was, she wasn't enjoying any of the children. That, that's really sad. I mean, in, in, in his letters, he, he keeps saying, why do you always nag them? Why do, can't you be kind to them? And um, she, ha she didn't have many motherly feelings because she was so obsessed with her husband. Victoria was in a very difficult position. On the one hand, she was the Queen of England. On the other, she was a young married woman who simply couldn't stop losing her temper, and sometimes the rages amounted to almost madness. She was married to a cold-hearted control freak who punished her when she lost her temper. This made her feel even more inadequate, but how she strove to improve herself 
Locked away in Windsor Castle are the most fascinating of the Queen's diaries, written later in her marriage. They were Victoria's secret, and they demonstrate how Albert had her in an emotional flux, by turns angry, elated, even self-flagellating. This volume is called Remarks, Conversations, Reflections. And here's what she writes on her wedding anniversary, February the 10th. What cause have I ever for gratitude? And yet, alas, how often, and even to my distress on this holy day, does my foolish susceptibility and irritability cause me misery for moments and annoyance to that most perfect and unselfish of human beings, my adored husband. She confides all these pathetic feelings about how unworthy she is and how, how she can't control herself. And, 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 and you get the feeling that this woman has been made to feel that she is sort of inadequate uh, in this relationship. How much do you think Albert controlled her? I think it was a controlling relationship. Victoria endlessly trying to improve herself and to impress Albert, Albert with her um, success in, in, in making herself a, a better person. You get the impression that at the end of every year, Victoria has a sort of a moral account system, if you like. She doesn't, you know, we do our accounts. Victoria did her moral accounts. Albert was succeeding where Sir John Conroy had failed, acquiring executive power by stealth. His design was grand. He wanted to change the course of history, and the children were his weapons. Creating more and more of them was part of a master plan devised with Baron Stockmar for the security of England and Europe. Albert knew that for a ruling monarch there was no such thing as a private life. The birth of each and every one of his children made a political statement. Europe was moving in a republican direction. Albert was determined to reverse this trend by making those children European kings and queens. Albert didn't want to be thought of as the young man from Coburg, meekly fitting into the traditions of the English royal house. He needed to be seen as a political force, and he looked for a powerful physical manifestation of his presence. Which is why in 1845 he acquired this estate, Osborne, on the Isle of Wight, overlooking the Solent in one of the most idyllic spots in southern England. It was to be his project. He designed it, he made it. Osborne was to be the embodiment of Prince Albert's ideals of family life, ideals which Queen Victoria herself enthusiastically endorsed. It is impossible to imagine a prettier spot. We have a charming beach, quite to ourselves. We can walk anywhere without being followed or mobbed. You might think you were entering the palace of an Italian Renaissance prince, of the kind that Prince Albert visited when he was a teenager. And in a way you are, only it's the palace of a modern Renaissance prince. The architectural design was Albert's, as was the original interior decor. Every artwork and sculpture steeped in Enlightenment ideals. It was originally minimalist. The later knick-knackery and clutter is all Victoria. When they first came here, she already had three small children, so she happily let him take a lead in matters aesthetic. But as the family grew, so did his ambition. These desks in Queen Victoria's sitting room are a symbolic reminder of how much she came to depend upon her husband. One for Albert, one for her. Actually, it was Albert who did most of the day-to-day -day work of the head of state, signing documents, reading cabinet papers, and so forth. While Victoria gave birth to nine babies, Albert drew more and more political power to himself. For a decade, Victoria saw Albert through a thick hormonal fog. Sometimes her resolve slipped. 
I am every day more convinced that we women, if we are to be good women, feminine and amiable and domestic, are not fitted to reign. The other great Victorian diarist, Charles Greville, noted that whilst Victoria had the title, after a few years of marriage, Albert was king to all intents and purposes. The royal family life was tellingly immortalized in oils by the German artist Winterhalter. When this picture was first exhibited at the Royal Academy in 1847, it was very much criticized. They thought the Queen of England lacked decorum. She was showing so much bare flesh. Her husband is extending a sexy finger into wifey's moist little palm. But what I think so interesting about this picture is that although Queen Victoria is wearing her coronet, it is Albert who is center stage. It's a picture of familial contentment, but also of Albert's success. By now, he'd achieved what he left Germany to do. Perhaps his greatest success was Princess Vicky. Whatever happened to Albert in the future, she would carry on his work, perhaps even control her mother. The Princess Royal was every inch Prince Albert's daughter. There was a tremendous kinship between Vicky and Albert. And obviously the Queen felt a little bit envious of this. But there was pride too. The family had visited Blair Castle back in 1844 when they first set eyes on an estate up in the north at Balmoral. Her mother wrote of her happiness at the toddler's maturity. Albert walked up the steps with me, I holding his arm and Vicky his hand, amid the loud cheers of the people, all the way to the carriage, our dear Vicky behaving like a grown-up person, not put out, nor frightened, nor nervous. Eleven years later, now aged 14, Vicky was back here with the family in the landscape of the Highlands that so reminded her father, the Prince Consort, of the dear German Heimat. But this was to be no ordinary family holiday of sketching and stalking. Victoria and Albert had long planned to marry each of their children off to different European royal houses in a series of political alliances. And this, the first such political scheme, was much the most significant. The Queen had vilified her manipulating mother but the master plan she and Albert had for Vicky's was every bit as Machiavellian. She and Friedrich Wilhelm, Crown Prince of Prussia, known as Fritz, were mere pawns. Victoria put the would-be lovers in the most romantic of settings, a place she and Albert loved. The Queen knew the effect these surroundings could have on sensitive youth. The possibilities had her all aflutter. Fritz looks very well, altogether looking more manly, and his moustache becomes him. The visit makes my heart beat as it may, and probably will decide the fate of our dear eldest child. He was 23. She was 14, little more than a child, in her sprig white muslin dress trimmed with red ribbons. But it was the start of a romance. They walked on the slopes of Craig Naban. He picked her a sprig of white heather. And there they had their first kiss. The plan had worked. Vicky loved Fritz. And that night ran into her mother's room to tell her. Having engineered the whole thing, Victoria, conflicted as ever, now tried to take control, insisting Vicky delay marriage until she was 17. Queen Victoria felt the classic envy that mothers so often feel for daughters when they emerge from childhood into womanhood, especially if the daughters have been very close to the father. She complained of Vicky's waywardness of temper, sharp answers and lack of self-control, a pretty ripe case, you might imagine, of the pot calling the kettle black. And as the wedding day approached, 
Queen Victoria felt all the usual cluster of emotions. She will no longer be an innocent girl, but a wife, and perhaps this time next year already a mother. They were married in January 1858. Then the newlyweds left for Prussia. Thus began one of the most remarkable correspondences in history in which a monarch of one country tried to control the behavior of a crown princess of another by post. The Queen Victoria does write lots of admonishing letters, you know, she, she doesn't want to let go. <laughs> it's very funny in some ways then, that Victoria thought she could still control the way she behaved at court, whether she was sitting down, standing up. I mean, even the tiniest details. It's ridiculous, yeah. I to mean, the point where the, the, the German authorities actually wrote back to London saying, can the Queen please stop bombarding the Crown Princess with all these terrible letters? When Vicky wrote that Fritz was to be a father, things came to a head. Most mothers at least pretend to be pleased at the prospect of becoming a grandmother. But when Vicky became pregnant, this was not the case. Having her nine children had placed great psychological strain, both on Queen Victoria herself and on her marriage. So in her letters to Vicky, we find that she does not hold back. What you say of the pride of giving life to an immortal soul is very fine, dear, but I cannot enter into that. I think much more of our being like a cow or a dog at such moments, when our poor nature becomes so very animal and unecstatic. But for you, dear, if you're sensible and reasonable, not in ecstasy, nor spending your day with nurses and wet nurses, which is the ruin of many a refined and intellectual young lady. The Queen was half of the most famous couple of the age. In her letters to Vicky, she reveals her ambivalence about marriage, tells truths that Princess Beatrice would surely have redacted had she got her hands on them. But she didn't. They stayed behind in Germany. And they are the business, because with these letters, you see her unmasked. There is a stream of consciousness pouring out of her two or three times a week to her daughter in Germany, uh, about everything under the sun, about the unsatisfactoriness of men and of marriage. All marriage is such a lottery. The happiness is always an exchange, though it may be a very happy one. Still, the poor woman is bodily and morally the husband's slave. That always sticks in my throat. She must have found writing in this way so very cathartic. The Queen's relationships with all her children, the jealousies, the criticism, show how pivotally she was affected by the tensions and pressures of her first formative years with her own mother. She'd never addressed that relationship, and in 1861, she ran out of time. Ever since Victoria married and had babies, her own mother had been an exemplary grandmother. Not a child's birthday got forgotten, not an anniversary overlooked. But since Conroy had been totally banished at the beginning of the reign, the poor Duchess of Kent lived in everlasting dread that she herself would one day be spurned. Victoria had convinced herself that it was her mother's heavy-handed parenting that had sundered the bond between them. But she was devastated when she learned that her mother was dying of cancer. I think it came like a thunderbolt upon us, and I think I never suffered as I did during those four dreadful hours till we heard she was better. I hardly knew myself how I loved her, or how my whole existence seemed bound up with her. For decades, they'd barely spoken. Victoria had written the story of her terrible parenting, and now, she was rewriting it all, in despair. I can't bear to think of all you have to go through. If only I could be near you and see you very often and long to beguile away the dull hours when you can't amuse yourself. But it was too little, too late. The Duchess didn't live to see Easter. Victoria threw herself on Albert, little knowing that this terrible year would be their last together. Albert himself was a sick man. They now seem to think he had Crohn's disease, or possibly abdominal cancer, or possibly both. 
And he died that same year, 1861, in December. Victoria was just 42 years old. She'd spent her life struggling against an oppressive childhood and against the tedium of motherhood. But however difficult her marriage had been, she had now grown totally dependent upon Albert. Writing to her uncle Leopold, she cried out, The poor fatherless baby is now utterly broken-hearted and crushed widow of 42. Victoria was often on the brink of instability. Now, grief precipitated a mental crisis that had some advisors wondering if she'd inherited the famous Hanoverian madness. It must be said that mourning became her, drama queen that she was. 1861 was her annus horribilis, her darkest hour. She ended it as an orphan and a widow. And it would be the making of her. The widow of Windsor, as she would come to be known, was no longer in the shadow of her brilliant puritanical angel, Albert. So there will be another story to be told. And it's a story of liberation from him, in which Victoria found herself alone, able along the journey to make some most unlikely friendships as she became her own woman. Next time, his life was over, but her life wasn't over. In Widow's Weeds, Victoria is anything but retiring. Her writings reveal a queen quite different to the icon we thought we knew. Freed from Albert, she becomes a politician, a diplomat, and perhaps a lover. Woman, what are you doing? The most powerful monarch on earth is a woman unchained. Is there a feeling, Dr. Reed, knew the nature of the relationship? Yes. And on the verge of a nervous breakdown. mortal soul is very fine dear but I cannot enter into that I think much more of our being like a cow or a dog at such moments when our poor nature becomes so very animal and unecstatic but for you dear if you're sensible and reasonable not in ecstasy nor spending your day with nurses and wet nurses which is the ruin of many a refined and intellectual young lady the Queen was half of the most famous couple of the age in her letters to Vicky she reveals her ambivalence about marriage, tells truths that Princess Beatrice would surely have redacted had she got her hands on them, but she didn't. They stayed behind in Germany, and they are the business, because with these letters, you see her unmasked. There is a stream of consciousness pouring out of her two or three times a week to her daughter in Germany, uh, about everything under the sun, about the unsatisfactoriness of men and of marriage, all marriage is such a lottery. The happiness is always an exchange, though it may be a very happy one. Still, the poor woman is bodily and morally the husband's slave. That always sticks in my throat. She must have found writing in this way so very cathartic. The Queen's relationships with all her children, the jealousies, the criticism, show how pivotally she was affected by the tensions and pressures of her first formative years with her own clashes of wills. Initially, Albert thought he'd won because Victoria said she'd obey him in the marriage ceremony, but that was just for show. Victoria saw Albert as a helper. Nothing better in her vision. She was writing letters and Albert was getting the blotting paper. That was his role. He wanted to be king. He wanted to have power. Albert wanted control. And all he had to do was to let nature take its course. Within a month of the wedding, Victoria was pregnant. <laughs> 
And when she first fell pregnant, she was pretty miserable. She just thought, this has happened so quickly. And she wrote to Uncle Leopold, who was thrilled and so excited, said, I, if I have a nasty girl at the end of all my trials, I'll drown it. Victoria was conflicted. She adored Albert and he wanted more children. But with every pregnancy, she had to give him more executive power. And he hadn't reckoned on her fury. After she gave birth to the Princess Royal, Vicky, she suffered from terrible postnatal depression, and there was a most awful row with Prince Albert. There is often an irritability in me, she wrote, which makes me say cross and odious things which I don't myself believe and which I fear hurt Albert. Albert just couldn't cope with the swings of emotion and with the rows, and he wrote in despair to old Dr. Stockmar, who was both a medical doctor as well as his political madness. She was married to a cold-hearted control freak who punished her when she lost her temper. This made her feel even more inadequate, but how she strove to improve herself. Locked away in Windsor Castle are the most fascinating of the Queen's diaries, written later in her marriage. They were Victoria's secret, and they demonstrate how Albert had her in an emotional flux, by turns angry, elated, even self-flagellating. This volume is called Remarks, Conversations, Reflections. And here's what she writes on her wedding anniversary, February the 10th. What cause have I ever for gratitude? And yet, alas, how often, and even to my distress on this holy day, does my foolish susceptibility and irritability cause me misery for moments and annoyance to that most perfect and unselfish of human beings, my adored husband. She confides all these pathetic feelings about how unworthy she is and how, how she can't control herself. And, 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 and you get the feeling that this woman has been made to feel that she is sort of inadequate. They stayed behind in Germany. And they are the business, because with these letters, you see her unmasked. There is a stream of consciousness pouring out of her two or three times a week to her daughter in Germany uh, about everything under the sun, about the unsatisfactoriness of men and of marriage. All marriage is such a lottery. The happiness is always an exchange, though it may be a very happy one. Still, the poor woman is bodily and morally the husband's slave. That always sticks in my throat. She must have found writing in this way so very cathartic. The Queen's relationships with all her children, the jealousies, the criticism, show how pivotally she was affected by the tensions and pressures of her first formative years with her own mother. She'd never addressed that relationship, and in 1861, she ran out of time. Ever since Victoria married and had babies, her own mother had been an exemplary grandmother. Not a child's birthday got forgotten, not an anniversary overlooked. But since Conroy had been totally banished at the beginning of the reign, the poor Duchess of Kent lived in everlasting dread that she herself would one day be spurned. Victoria had convinced herself that it was her mother's heavy-handed parenting that had sundered the bond between... Osborne was to be the embodiment of Prince Albert's ideals of family life, ideals which Queen Victoria herself enthusiastically endorsed. It is impossible to imagine a prettier spot. We have a charming beach quite to ourselves. We can walk anywhere without being followed or mobbed. You might think you were entering the palace of an Italian Renaissance prince, of the kind that Prince Albert visited when he was a teenager. And in a way you are, only it's the palace of a modern Renaissance prince. The architectural design was Albert's, as was the original interior decor every artwork and sculpture steeped in enlightenment ideals. It was originally minimalist, 
the later knick-knackery and clutter is all Victoria. When they first came here, she already had three small children, so she happily let him take a lead in matters aesthetic. But as the family grew, so did his ambition. These desks in Queen Victoria's sitting room are a symbolic reminder of how much she came to depend upon her husband. One for Albert, one for her. Actually, it was Albert who did most... In spite of my illness and their harshness, my beloved Leitzen supporting me alone. From now on, Victoria was just waiting to be 18 and rid of the influence of Conroy and her mother. She began to forget her happy childhood and dwell only on the sad things. The experience at Ramsgate had poisoned her childhood memory and fueled her resentment against her mother. The myth of the totally unhappy childhood was born. But Victoria was also possessed of a sense of destiny. She knew that Uncle William wasn't going to be alive for much longer. The king had fathered 12 children, but no living legitimate heir. In June 1837, he died in his sleep of a heart attack. Her mother woke Victoria. I got out of bed and went into my sitting room, only in my dressing gown, alone, and saw them. Kneeling before her, the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Lord Chamberlain were now her subjects. Victoria, more German than British, was now queen. She was ready to throw herself into the role. The survival of the monarchy itself depended on her sergeant. He saw what she needed and he lavished it on her. In her diary, Queen Victoria had described herself as the little fatherless girl. Now the 58-year-old Prime Minister made sure she felt in control, but safe in his care. It was he who prepared Victoria and who stage-managed the momentous coronation here at Westminster Abbey in June 1838. Since 1066, almost every English monarch has been crowned here. Victoria had been raised to be ready for this pivotal moment in her own life and that of the nation since her birth. There was a two-day fair in the park. There were illuminations. There was a firework display. There were people swarming into central London to see their new queen. She was woken at 4 a.m. by the booming of the guns in the park. And yet, she doesn't mention her mother once when she came to write it up in her journal. The central figure for Victoria on her coronation day was Lord M. My excellent Lord Melbourne, who stood very close to me throughout the whole ceremony, was completely overcome at this moment and... Out. He wanted to cash in his chips. He claimed that Victoria had privately offered him a huge pension of £3,000 a year and an English peerage. Well, Melbourne wasn't having any of that, though he did offer Conroy an Irish peerage which was refused. The influence of Conroy was now decisively over. There is no end to the amusing anecdotes and stories Lord Melbourne tells, and he tells them all in such an amusing and funny way. The passionate friendship which sprang up between them gave to the young queen the security she craved, and to Melbourne, reeling from a shattered marriage, someone to care for. Really, every day he was with us, sometimes for five hours a day. They'd ride together, they'd do jigsaws together, they'd play cards together. He participated in all of this. And through this constant being by the Queen's side, he gained a lot of influence, a lot of power. And essentially, he could really tell her what her role was. So what he had was something people envied incredibly. Her education started here. The journals bubble with her conversations with Lord M. They talked of everything under the sun, from French history to Shakespeare, from mixed-race marriages to Whig society gossip. It wasn't just the politics 
Albert drew more and more political power to himself. For a decade, Victoria saw Albert through a thick hormonal fog. Sometimes her resolve slipped. I am every day more convinced that we women, if we are to be good women, feminine and amiable and domestic, are not fitted to reign. The other great Victorian diarist, Charles Greville, noted that whilst Victoria had the title, after a few years of marriage, Albert was king to all intents and purposes. The royal family life was tellingly immortalized in oils by the German artist Winterhalter. When this picture was first exhibited at the Royal Academy in 1847, it was very much criticized. They thought the Queen of England lacked decorum. She was showing so much bare flesh. Her husband is extending a sexy finger into wifey's moist little palm. But what I think so interesting about this picture is that although Queen Victoria is wearing her coronet, it is Albert who is center stage. It's a picture of familial contentment, but also of Albert's success. By first fell pregnant, she was pretty miserable. She just thought, this has happened so quickly. And she wrote to Uncle Leopold, who was thrilled and so excited, said, I, if I have a nasty girl at the end of all my trials, I'll drown it. Victoria was conflicted. She adored Albert, and he wanted more children. But with every pregnancy, she had to give him more executive power and he hadn't reckoned on her fury. After she gave birth to the Princess Royal, Vicky, she suffered from terrible postnatal depression, and there was a most awful row with Prince Albert. There is often an irritability in me, she wrote, which makes me say cross and odious things which I don't myself believe and which I fear hurt Albert. Albert just couldn't cope with the swings of emotion and with the rows, and he wrote in despair to old Dr. Stockmar, who was both a medical doctor as well as his political advisor, for advice. Victoria is too hasty and passionate for me to be able often to speak of my difficulties. She will not hear me out, but flies into a rage and overwhelms me with reproaches of suspiciousness, want of trust, ambition, envy. She was at once furious and adoring. She missed the brief but golden period when Albert was hers alone. She was jealous of the children on whom he lavished his attention. But while Victoria's diaries recall a lonely childhood, we must remember she was prone to reinterpreting her own story. Deirdre Murphy is curator of the Victoria Revealed exhibition at Kensington Palace. So this is the room that Princess Victoria was supposedly born in. Oh, she was born here? Yeah. Yes, she was born in this room. One of her dolls' houses? Yes, from the late 1820s. And she had lots of dolls? She had lots of dolls. She made them herself with her governess, Baroness Leitzen, and together had lots of fun dressing them. There were animals. She had a beautiful looking Charles Spaniel named Dash. She would play with him in the gardens and every now and then would dress him up in costumes. <laughs> she did have quite a happy childhood when she looked back on it. She saw it as unhappy. And I wonder whether you think, in fact, it was the bullying of Conroy when she was a teenager that led her to have this view. I completely agree with that. These memories that she brings back throughout her life later on are not necessarily reliable because she changes her view from time to time. So in, in 1872, her eldest daughter Vicky is marrying and having children. She writes to Vicky about how difficult her childhood was, giving her advice about how to cheat, treat her own children. And this is a theme that marks through her letters and correspondence. But we clearly can't rely on that completely because she clearly had fun here. She was indulged and the sort of behavior a more enlightened mother might have influenced if she'd been more present in Victoria's life. The Duchess was now very much behind the scenes, but she was nevertheless quietly engineering her daughter's future and her own. The question on everybody's lips was, who was the young queen going to marry? And broadly speaking, there were three options. She could have married her cousin in England, 
George, Duke of Cambridge, who was a soldier her age. They were fast friends throughout their lives, but George used to say rather ungallantly he'd never wanted to marry plain little Victoria. Old William IV had wanted her to marry into the Dutch royal family, but Victoria was having none of that. The two eligible princes of Orange were frightful oafs. And then there was the third option, favoured by Uncle Leopold, King of the Belgians, and by her mother. And that was that she should forge a political alliance with her Coburg cousin, Prince Albert. Since 1714, the English Hanoverian royal family had been German. Victoria was by descent a member of this family, but her mother was of a different line, the Saxe Coburg Gotas, and so was Albert. They saw in this marriage a chance for the family effectively to take over the running of Great Britain. Monitoring letters, you know, she, she doesn't want to let go. <laughs> it's very funny in some ways, Brenda, that Victoria thought she could still control the way she behaved at court, whether she was sitting down, standing up. I mean, even the tiniest details. It's ridiculous, yeah. To I mean, the point where the, the, the German authorities actually wrote back to London saying, can the Queen please stop bombarding the Crown Princess with all these terrible letters? When Vicky wrote that Fritz was to be a father, things came to a head. Most mothers at least pretend to be pleased at the prospect of becoming a grandmother. But when Vicky became pregnant, this was not the case. Having her nine children had placed great psychological strain, both on Queen Victoria herself and on her marriage. So in her letters to Vicky, we find that she does not hold back. What you say of the pride of giving life to an immortal soul is very fine, dear, but I cannot enter into that. I think much more of our being like a cow or a dog at such moments, when our poor nature becomes so very animal and unecstatic. But for you, dear, if you're sensible and reasonable, not in ecstasy, nor spending your day with nurses and wet nurses, which is the ruin of many a refined and intellectual young lady. The Queen was half of the most famous couple of the age, in her letters to Vicky, she reveals her ambivalence about marriage, tells truths that Prince formative years with her own mother. She'd never addressed that relationship, and in 1861, she ran out of time. Ever since Victoria married and had babies, her own mother had been an exemplary grandmother. Not a child's birthday got forgotten, not an anniversary overlooked. But since Conroy had been totally banished at the beginning of the reign, the poor Duchess of Kent lived in everlasting dread that she herself would one day be spurned. Victoria had convinced herself that it was her mother's heavy-handed parenting that had sundered the bond between them. But she was devastated when she learned that her mother was dying of cancer. I think it came like a thunderbolt upon us, and I think I never suffered as I did during those four dreadful hours till we heard she was better. I hardly knew myself how I loved her or how my whole existence seemed bound up with her. For decades, they'd barely spoken. Victoria had written the story of her terrible parenting and now she was rewriting it all in despair. I can't bear to think of all you have to go through. If only I could be near you and see you very often and long to beguile away the dull hours when you can't amuse yourself. Duchess of Kent was not so lucky. Victoria was now no longer a child and felt able to flex her muscles for all to see. She shunned her mother. The Duchess of Kent was a woman destroyed. She couldn't believe that Victoria didn't want to see her. Victoria wanted to get away from her mother at every opportunity, and the whole court saw this. Victoria confided in her journal her ongoing coldness to her mother. It has been observed that after the marriage, I kissed the Queen Mother and only shook hands with Mama, which I said was true. It's heartrending to read the cry of the rejected mother seeking the approval of the callous daughter. In the year after Victoria married, her mother wrote to her, Oh, Victoria, 
Why are you so cold and indifferent with your mother, who loves you so dearly? But the Queen had eyes for Albert and Albert alone. He appeared to be her dream come true. Victoria was in raptures. Her mother, who'd planned the whole thing, was sidelined. Victoria took a lease of £2,000 a year on this house, 36 Belgrave Square, and she dumped her mother in it. It's handy for the palace, I can see. Mom ...had given him power over Victoria. Peel's lack of it almost guaranteed a battle of wills. Their first meeting sparked a constitutional crisis. Peel almost immediately said, you've got to change your ladies. The ladies of the robes, ladies of the bedchamber, they want a wigs, they now have to be Tories. And Victoria, she couldn't cope with this. She said to Peel, I'm not changing my ladies. I am not doing this. Peel surprised her by saying, in that case, he wouldn't be her prime minister. It became known as the bedchamber crisis. Robert Peel was a very astute politician. By refusing to be prime minister, he demonstrated quite a lot of things to the world at large. He demonstrated that Victoria was a Whig partisan. He'd also demonstrated that she was trying to exercise the kind of monarchical power which no longer existed in Britain. This was the last time the British monarch ever openly defied uh, a represented politician. Victoria felt victorious, but her intransigence pointed up her immaturity. That she put her own selfish needs before those of Parliament was visible to all, and the ramifications were immense. Peel's refusal to serve created a vacuum. Melbourne was forced to return as Prime Minister of a weak Whig government which lasted just two more years. <laughs> 